live. I can, I'll write it and we'll do it live. So to get that perfect barbecue, you use wood. Are you sure it's safe? Whatever. We put the lighter fluid on, strike the match, and... Oh. Should we call the fire department? That might be a good idea. Good afternoon and welcome to the really big barbecue central show starting the third day of live broadcasting here from the National Barbecue and Grilling Association's IMBBQ 2018 yearly conference. We're right here in Fort Worth, Texas. Happy to have you aboard here on your Saturday afternoon, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Or good afternoon. 12 o'clock here local. You should see fit to jump in on this here show at some point during this three-hour broadcast. You can uh, run an email at me, greg at the BBQ Central Show. Again, that's greg at the BBQ Central Show.com. I will try and mix those in. And here's what's happening in case you did not get on the Facebook a little bit earlier today for the projection Coming up in a really a matter of minutes, she is promoting the Hardcore Carnivore book, amongst other things. She's live right here at MDBQA. We'll be talking to the Hardcore Carnivore herself, live and in person, Jess Priles. You've also seen her on my show any number of times. So we'll talk to her uh, about the book to some degree, but I, I would like to change it up a little bit. Uh, she's been doing a lot of press junket stuff anyway, talking about the book, doing a lot of interviews with standard media. Uh, I don't know if podcasting is what you would consider standard media anymore. I still think that it's a little bit out of the ordinary that uh, the infancy is still kind of where it's at. Podcasting in itself, I think, is a, is a weird name. I don't know if people really assimilate some kind of message with podcasting. To sound like an old guy, I think the younger, gener- the younger generation gets it. They understand podcasting. That's really where they're getting a lot of their information, and they are subscribing to like-minded podcasts so they can continue to, to fuel the beliefs and the mindsets that they have. And that may or may not be doing some kind of a disservice, kind of giving you that tunnel vision. But from a technology standpoint, they certainly get it. And they are subscribing, and this is how they stay informed, and this is the way that they like to consume their stuff. And I hope it's the way you like to consume your stuff as well. So you can subscribe to my show, thebbqcentralshow.com, and then at the top you can hit the subscribe button, and away you go. So I would like to get out of maybe the traditional media stuff and talk to her just about general barbecue and grilling stuff. We'll obviously hit the book. Maybe many of you are tuning in because you just heard that she wrote a book or you've been following her on social media and you want to hear her hype it up a little bit, which I'm sure she's more than happy to do. Maybe give you a recipe or two or kind of give you the idea of where the thought process was behind this book and the things that she's looking to get across. So Jess Pryles is technically on the clock at this point. And we will be excited to welcome her into this makeshift podcast studio. Uh, At 12.45, we will be joined by a friend of the show, holding it down in Denver, Jason Ganahl, GQ Barbecue. And uh, I have never met, well, like most of these people, I've never met them in person. And uh, I've talked to Jason a number of times here on the show. He was competitive barbecue guy up front. Then he eventually got into the restaurant business, and uh, now we can kind of track his progress, which we've kind of been doing uh, on the show. So uh, excited to talk to Jason in person. Hey, by the way, Jess Piles right here. Woo! That camera does work, by the way. Oh, does it? Yeah, just in case. So uh, thanks for jumping in. 
Thanks Appreciate for having that. me here. You got it. I'm so glad I get to see you face to face for the first time. You know how many people have ever said that? Not many people. <laughs> I'm so much. I'm so happy we can talk on the phone or on the internet. It's never face to face, but I get it. Uh, at 1:30, we will be joined by a team Traeger member, an author, a cooking class instructor, somebody I've known. We literally entered the barbecue and grilling world together, almost like the same day. Uh, Danielle Bennett, DBQ. And then that third hour is a little sketchy. There's a number of different things. It could be jumping off. It could be a Joey Machado. It could be the guys from Grilla Grills. I mean, who knows what's going to happen? So uh, we'll see how that third hour plays out. Because usually it's a two-hour show, so I would be packing up and I'm done, scheduled. But now we're winding out that third hour, which... It's really been kind of a task. I didn't realize adding an additional 60 minutes was going to be that much more work from a preparation standpoint than a talking standpoint. But you, can you talk for three hours straight without an issue? Because it, it, I know it sounds easy, but then you get into that third hour and it's like, okay, I'm going to need like a water, a piece of gum, something. To also, uh, I've found that the bathroom becomes an issue in that <laughs> third hour. It, it's never been an issue for a two-hour show for 12 years and the last two days. That third hour has been kind of a bathroom problem. Mm, yeah. So hold off on that on sweet tea. Well, the good news is I have this is going to be potentially TMI, but uh, I'm like on the road sales guy during the day. And there's been any number of times where I've been coming out of Columbus, Ohio. So that's about a two hour shot from mm. where I live in Cleveland. And I have to go. And I'm like, I want to get home. I don't want to wait. I'll wait a couple exits. So then I get a couple exits up and I'm like, well, I'll just wait a couple more exits. Well, all of a sudden I've waited the whole two hours. So I have That's the bad for your body. You know that yeah, my wife says that all the yeah. time. I think it's like I'm training it. I'm making it stronger, like working out your muscles and stuff. She's like, That's exactly the opposite of what you're really hurting yourself. So I just think it's like maybe a badge of honor that I'm wearing. That yeah. I can, if well, I need if to hold it. It's an internal badge. Like, <laughs> yeah. who's going to know? Yeah, I'm the camel of uh, urine, I guess. You know, if I need to, I can hold it. You know, this is why people tune in because, you know, when you, <laughs> you get into the nitty gritty, the right. camel of urine, the everybody camel. here, right. next time you see Greg, I'd like right. you to say, sir, you are a bastion yeah. of the camel That's of urine. Right. I think, we, I think <laughs> we, we have a t shirt coming up, no doubt about it. Boom. Um, I didn't want to just do the whole, I mean, you've been on kind of like this press junket thing and you're doing a lot of interviews mm -hmm. and traditional media, digital media, all this stuff. And I'm like, you know, do you want to do yet another one? We're definitely going to talk about the book. I know it's a big deal, but <laughs> you know, I've been here since Wednesday evening yep. and I learned a lot Thursday on that mm -hmm. show. You had asked the question, can you talk for three hours? Conceptually, before I got here, I was like, this will be a piece of cake. So I prepped up like normal, but my prep is two hours. So where I thought I was good, when we rolled into that third hour, it was like, wow. This is work. I got to stretch it out. Yeah. I got to make sure the next day I have 50 things more to talk about just in case. Um, so by the time that second day rolled around, it was great. The guests were good. They were holding it down. Neat. It's really great when your guests yeah. do like their job instead of me hosting and <laughs> being kind of a guest at the same time. It helps. It, it really is. So um, I promise to do a good job for you. Plus, we spoke about potentially talking about something today about aging, right? We're going to talk about dry aging. Yeah, I want to. I definitely want to hit on that for sure, because I know you had just kind of dropped a, how many words was it? A 3,000 3, word truth wow. bomb. Wow. And, you know, the, the impetus of this conversation was a previous conversation, not with you, that I had had on the show. And so this is like where it's weird for me because I kind of bill myself as the ESPN of the barbecue and grilling industry. Mm -hmm. I never bill myself as an expert, number one, but I do love to talk to experts. And nowadays, it's tough to be able to find the barometer of everybody can jump on a keyboard or an Instagram or any social media and say, I'm an expert or perhaps worse just kind of pass themselves off as an expert. Right. And they talk well and there's passion and there seems to be some substance behind the information they're passing along until the next day when you wake up and dudes from Detroit who make their living at dry aging drop you an email and go, that segment that you had the last night, all of that was wrong. And they started breaking it down. And I think I know who you're talking about. I the, feel the like responsible 
like I'm like, dude, that wasn't I didn't mean that. And I don't know. I don't think my guest was in the wrong place here, like from a militia standpoint. But (laughs) I also don't want to be the disseminator of bad information. Right. And then you hit me up and you're like, hey, you know, I've been working on this thing and Mm -hmm. it's getting ready to drop here in a couple of weeks. And that was, you know, like a month ago or whatever. Yeah, it was a while ago. So let's talk a little bit about dry aging, because I find it unique in the fact that uh, when my oldest daughter and I go on the road for volleyball, if it's just me and her, Mm -hmm. we'll go and like search out a a really good steak joint in town. It's kind of like our little bonding thing. And we love to get the dry aged steaks. Mm -hmm. And we were in Louisville this past weekend, Mm -hmm. got dry aged steak and it was tough. Every fiber of my being was saying, this is total bullshit. This is not a dry aged steak. I don't even know if this is a prime steak, let alone a dry aged steak. <laughs> well, yeah, so, they're not mutually exclusive. Where did you get the motivation, or what was driving you to do this work on dry aging? So we had dry aging was much more common in Australia than it was here. We we so my exposure to it was probably before a lot of folks had even heard of the term over here. Um, and then I'd been lucky enough to eat, you know, there's a, there's a place in Dallas called Knife run by Chef John Tisar, who he does some very, what we call extreme dry aging. Um, and I got to experience that, you know, that once you have dry aged steak, if you like it, cause not, it's not to every palate, most people will, um, you don't really want to have anything else. <laughs> it, it's a certain flavor. So I got more interested in it. But of course, I like to base a lot of what I do on meat science. And I was just really hesitant to suggest, excuse me, people do it at home because I wasn't exactly sure. I knew that there was a safety element to it. Mm-hmm. And so I had started speaking to a lot of PhD meat science um, professors and just, just PhDs and professionals in the industry to understand what it was because especially last holiday season, I was getting a ton of emails from people. Oh, I just ordered my prime rib for my butcher Christmas in two weeks. Right. Um, <laughs> how should I dry age it? And I'm like, well, do you have a dry aging fridge? No. Do you know what dry aging fridge? They don't, that no one knew what it was. They just had heard the term. And I was concerned that a lot of folks were just throwing naked beef into their refrigerators. And so I knew it was time to kind of write this. The reason is 3000 words is because I tried to absolutely cover everything about actually how to do it at home. So not just what it is, but how to safely do it. Um, the safety aspect of it is that basically as long as you cook it correctly, uh, which has a lot, mainly a lot to do with the bone, um, you should actually cut that bone away and then roast it to, to, till it's quite hot to make sure all the bacteria is killed. The only thing you need to be careful of is black mold. Um, and as long as you don't have black mold, other mold is okay. But the main thing is this. Dry aging is really expensive and it's really expensive because of the setup and because of how much you lose as that product shrinks. And you're talking about just in general, if you're going to do it at home or if you're doing it in a commercial setting, the process itself is expensive. Correct. Okay. Yeah, because not only is it that loss, but let's just say that you're a butcher that's doing it. You now have to dedicate a facility right. uh, to just holding it there. And I mean, some of these dry aging rooms are, you know hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of product just sitting there aging. So it's it's not cheap. I guess the thing is this, true dry aged meat has a very distinct flavor. And, you know, it's, it's kind of like, I think that there's a lot of people who can empathize in the barbecue world with the term barbecue. Mm-hmm. And just because you put barbecue sauce on something and put it in a slow cooker is arguably, certainly by this crowd here, not barbecue. Right. And I, I think for me, it's the same concept with dry aging, that there's a certain way to do it. And you might have other ways that you emulate that or get close to it with, for example, one of the bags or you have a system at home. But I'm just trying to educate people that's not actually dry aging. Have you seen, we had talked about the bags before, mm-hmm. Have you seen that product called the Steak Ager um, where it's, I guess, made to go? And I think he does say you need to have a dedicated fridge, but it's made for one of those dorm style, like college dorm style refrigerators. And it goes in and Mm -hmm. there's a bunch of different technology that's happening in there. But I think where the potential detraction or where where the non over fascination with it is, it's pretty limited as far as how much you can put in. If you're going to do it at home and you buy... X size refrigerator or mm-hmm. cooling mechanism that you're going to be dedicating to that, you can kind of call your shots as how much beef you're going to want to age. 
at so any this given is, time. Yeah, and this is one of the things that I touched upon that a lot of people don't realize. It's it, The problem with the stake ager is there's a couple of things. So first of all, the number one thing you need is a dedicated facility. And why fat picks up is the same reason we keep baking soda in, in a refrigerator to pick up odors. Fat picks up other odors. And you don't want you know, your pasta from last night yeah. leaking into your beef. It, there's still, because that fan in the steak edger box is still extracting from the fridge itself, there's there's cross-contaminant, which can can effectively lead to oxidizing rancidity, which is off flavor. So it's not going to make you sick, but it's going to taste terrible. Mm -hmm. um, the other part of it is this. Dry-edged steak is really about the mold uh, the strain of mold, how much of it, that's a personal preference thing. And, and it's like wine terroir. So mm -hmm. little microclimates. If you start in a brand new box and you put a piece of beef in there, you don't have anything to start with. You're just, you're just taking the moisture out, but not actually introducing those nutty kind of blue cheesy flavors that are really the hallmarks of dry aged beef. Because of course, wet aging, although it promotes tenderness, doesn't change the flavor at all. Mm -hmm. Uh, so what you want to do is basically inoculate your fridge. So you need room to have at least two pieces in there with a starter piece that I recommend you buy from, you know, somewhere else that's offering dry aged material and you want it untrimmed because you want all that mold on it. And that kicks it off. So that introduces the environment, just like when you make salami or charcuterie and you need to introduce mold to cover the outside. It's the same concept. The other big thing you hear about with steak dry aging mm -hmm. is the longevity of it. Mm -hmm. Should you be at 20 days? Should you be at 750 days? Should you be wrapping the meat and soaking it in Jack Daniels? Is there like a certain point where when you start aging and you get to X day, any day after that isn't going to exponentially increase a tenderness or a flavor profile? Yeah, it's a great question. So generally speaking, for both wet and dry aging, after the 28-day mark, any tenderness benefits completely drop off the bell curve. Uh, it just gets to a point, and of course, it depends on what cut you're using. So tenderloin is not going to become any more tender than maybe, say, putting a ribeye in there. Uh, there. There's more in a ribeye to get tender than there is in a tenderloin. So that's that. But 28 days is the, is the point at which it's not going to get any more tender. Uh, the thing, the flavor will continue to develop in dry aging as long as you let it roll. Where the variable happens is, you know, what 60 days in my fridge might taste like in, in comparison to 60 days in someone else's fridge could be very different, which is why when you start a home dry aging project, just like homebrew, you need to kind of try and, and, and taste it at different stages and figure out where your sweet spot for your unit is. But it basically becomes the general, this is the generally accepted kind of time frame. You won't really taste any true dry aged flavors, anything under 40 days as, as a rule of thumb. And there are people in you know, TSAR takes these all the way to 240 days. Um, somewhere in between that it, the product turns into a delicacy. So it turns from a more pronounced beefier flavor to becoming more further along the spectrum in terms of how many people are going to enjoy that flavor because it's so intense, exactly mm -hmm. like blue cheese. Does it ever get to a point? Can you age it too long where it's just going to be like me? Or yeah, it goes I mean, bad or it's dangerous to eat? Not really. It'll get to, if you let it, theoretically, if you let it go too far, it'll just be that the product has, has withered into nothing because you're just keeping on losing moisture and losing moisture. And uh, eventually, we're talking, you know, years here, mm -hmm. you'll end up with jerky <laughs> um, because you have to cut away that rind on the outside. Uh, but... I've, I, you can take it as far as you want it, but I've had steak put down in front of me, which was only 128 days in Australia. But again, you know, TSR's 240 wasn't as pungent or, or strong as this 128. And the uh, server put it down in front of us and said, oh, don't mind that smell. That's because it's dry aged. And I think when it can emanate <laughs> up that intensely from the plate, that's when it starts becoming really divisive in terms of will it appeal to people or not. Does it appeal to you? It does. It did. It, that was probably the cusp for like me. Like from a fascination standpoint, like I yeah. smell it and I want to taste it, even though it might not be like something that's overly appealing to me, but you still want to do it. Oh, yeah. I'll certainly still try it. Um, and again, that's when it depends on the strain of the mold and all that kind of the strength and all that kind of stuff that's in there. But I like it. I'm, I'm pro. I've got I've, I've got obviously my own setup going on right now and I've got two primals that have been in there since the 20th of January and I'm going to give them at least 80 days. 
is there a certain size of meat that you should be using to dry age? Yeah. So you need to use what, like primals um, or subprimals. And the thing is, you're not going to be able to get these at most butchers, even at Costco. You need to get it at the stage before exterior caps have come out. You want to get it on the bone. And the reason that you want that is because you're going to have to trim all that away. So the bone will act as a protector um, to stop as much loss as it could be. If you If you go out and buy, let's say a strip loin, uh, and you buy it at, at somewhere like a wholesale market or something like that, it's already going to have been trimmed for domestic use. Mm -hmm. So you can still use it, absolutely, but you're going to be losing so much on the outside because it's just going to turn into that dark, hard rind. And while that's not unsafe to eat because you'll be searing any bacteria off the surface, it's completely unpalatable. So you really do need to make sure that you cut it away. It's not going to get softer with cooking. Is there something that you can do with that rind after the fact? Can you like melt it down and purify it and use it as a dressing or anything like that? Or you just cut it and you wouldn't toss want it? to with the fat because you're not gonna you're not gonna get it hot enough to get rid of the bacteria. That's that's the first thing. And and there's a point at which even if you put it through a grinder, it's still gonna have an unpleasant texture. But there you know, once you're past that very outer edge, you know, you arguably could use the next kind of layer in through a burger grind or something like that. And I wanna just point out while I have the opportunity that um, the, the, the juice that you see in wet aging bags okay. is not a agent. There's no additive there. Um, that's called purge. So that's the natural um, internal waters that, uh, and, and moisture that's coming out of beef as it sits in the bag. That's, that's not, nothing added to it. It's what was in there to start. What else from a dry aging standpoint that people need to know about in order to get off on that right foot? Uh, you know, again, I would certainly welcome anybody to come and read this article because there, it's not it's not just as simple as this, and I think that's the point. Yeah. Um, I guess, you know, to answer people about the, the bags that, that are out there, um, the argument with the bags is even though they've got uh, university research behind it, that research stopped at 21 days, which, as we've just discussed, is not – nearly enough to be representative of actual dry aging. Uh, and the other thing the bag doesn't do is really allow for moisture loss. The biggest part about dry aging is that moisture loss concentrates the beef flavor and also allows mold to grow on the outside. So it's like this. If you, if you have used a, a bag or similar product and you enjoy it, then certainly go ahead and use it. It's for you. We don't hate on what's working for you as right, long as right. it's not making you sick. But just please be aware that that's not um, what anybody in the industry would consider true dry aging. Can you set a strain of bacteria or whatever is on that meat is what you're going to end up be working with? Well, it's so it's funny. My, you know, De Braga in New York were big, big uh, uh, dry aging house. They were one of the original purveyors down in the meatpacking district. They supplied certified Angus with a uh, certified Angus beef with their first starter. And then I got mine from that certified Angus beef facility in Worcester, Ohio. Mm -hmm. Shout out to Ohio. Yep. Hey, hey. And when De Braga sent theirs to Ohio, the natural like spores in the air, all that kind of stuff would then change that terroir. And as that comes to me in Texas and, you know, every time you open the door, you're letting new environments in there, which is why we're trying to control it by not having, you know, please don't turn it into your beer fridge as well. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, and please don't put your like venison quarters in there temporarily, especially with hair and stuff on it still. So um, it, it keeps changing. That's why... People like Walter Apfelbaum, who's at Prime and Proper in Detroit, he tries to limit the mold growth because he prefers a beefier rather than blue cheesier flavor on his beef. And that's a serious that, – that's serious to cultivate in there. You know, he's got to keep things at a humidity level and, and, and try and mitigate that as best as he can. So it certainly becomes an art, just like a fine charcuterie master. You know, we, we've, we've gotten these certain Italian prosciuttos have their certain flavor because it's by the coast and it's got seawater and all this sort of stuff. And that's why it's, you know, doesn't taste the same in other areas. Even Benton's ham, you know, in, in, their, in their rick houses, in their dry aging houses is going to have a certain flavor. Are you surprised that there has been a renaissance, if you will, maybe over the last three or four years? I've been using the term, I mean, I hate to say it, but a lot of my guests here are a little older than me. Um, you know, as you kind of survey the NBBQA crowd, it's not like probably the most tech savvy and 
hipster crowd ever. Uh, so I've been using the term millennials a lot just to reference a certain group. But okay. they seem to be – so for as much crap as everybody – that's 50 years or older wants to give them for being lazy and unmotivated and they don't want to leave their parents' homes and get jobs and blah, blah, blah. I think you can also point to the fact that they've kind of driven, I want to know, or helped drive, I want to know where my meat and my poultry and stuff are coming from and how it's raised and how they dispatch it. I want to know more about dry aging. They're really taking a hands-on approach to knowing everything about how the food they're going to eat is getting there and then how to cook it so they can eat it and kind of dispelling that they're just lazy and they want everything done for them. They're kind of helping drive this whole process. I think so, definitely. And, you know, we touched upon the concept of craft brewing earlier, and I think that's part of it, too. Yeah, you can go to the grocery store and just buy yourself a six-pack, but part of it is understanding the process and having you go at it yourself, you know, provided it's not too difficult to do. And, and if you're, a, if you're a meat fan, just like if you're going to invest in a two, $3,000 smoker, why wouldn't you also see what you can do to, to maximize your own, uh, meat consumption at home or yeah. the quality of that? How has the article been received since release? It's been amazing. I was very humble that, uh, uh, Dr. Jeff Savel of Texas A&M University, who has done some serious research into dry aging, like you know, obviously published in scientific journals and what have you, was disseminating the article, retweeting it, sharing it, which is you know effectively a big stamp of approval on it. Mm-hmm. Um, that was th- that was for me when I knew it worked. I had even a gentleman here, Sean from New York, came up and said, "I loved that article. I just you know I've been eating dry aged beef for whatever because for for the longest time because we have it in New York and it's so." helpful to understand um so it's it's been received really well when you are starting the whole research project and you finally get it to release what kind of a time span are you in when you're like you said you're calling all these scientists and you're trying to make sure that whatever you're about ready to release because your reputation on the line right and if you're going to submit something out and say here's kind of a gold standard uh reference point of what dry aging is all about what's the time span it takes from let's do this to go ahead and read it. I I think it depends on the topic. In this case, you know, I I was curious just to understand about it before I wanted to write the definitive guide because I do get asked about this stuff and it's, it's the point of being a hardcore carnivore and the point of doing what I do is I have a genuine natural curiosity to understand new aspects of the meat world uh, or even this is not that new, but it's sort of new in popularity. And so it had started probably, you know, two years ago, understanding what dry aging is. I, I wrote an article on the website, the difference between dry and wet aging over a year and a half ago. Mm-hmm. But it got to that stage, that main impetus, as I mentioned, was starting to see that it had blown up to the point where people were going to start, you know, messing around incorrectly. Um, and then it took a, a couple of months of, it wasn't also just one source. I wanted to make sure it was verified by multiple sources too. Let's talk quickly about the book. You're out here doing signings. Mm-hmm. You've been, you know, kind of all over the place. Now, I am all over the place. Right. I'm I mean, exhausted. so it was released <laughs> uh, originally. It was an Australian piece, and then it has finally worked its way back over here. Have you seen a difference in reception between? an Australian and an American, or has it been pretty well received regardless? I was really lucky in Australia. So it was out in Australia, UK, and New Zealand uh, last September or August, September. And they, it was in like our major department stores, like be it high end or, or lower end. And so to see it so accessible and then have it like keep momentum into Christmas was really neat. But the one thing that's happened over here is I obviously live here now we still in Australia being as proud as we are of what the local barbecue scene is, have a complete reverence for what happens over here. You know, getting to sign a book today and give it to Chris Lilly or Sam Jones. It's like, Who? Oh yeah. <laughs> like, Oh yeah. Thank you. Just, you know, and, and I'm lucky enough to call them friends too. But so on a personal note, it, it's sort of a, a stamp on how far I've come and that hard work pays off. The other thing is Amazon and to be able to watch that book when it came out, because obviously, you know, we, we've just gotten Amazon Australia, so it's not even the same thing. For it to hit new bestseller in the new release category and then in multiple categories that they listed under, like outdoor cooking and specific ingredients, southern cooking, 
was just like, oh my God, this is going to work. And the, the coolest part, I guess, was, you know, I spoke to Amy Mills about this too. People get it in their hands and it's a really nice hardcover coffee table book. Mm -hmm. And they go, oh, oh, this is, this is like a real nice book. You've got really nice photography in here. I'm like, oh, did you think that I was just like <laughs> Xeroxing coffees at home? Because yeah, right. I think it's exactly what you say with that sort of self-proclaimed expert or, you know, the, the accessibility to social media is a double-edged sword. So, uh, you know, I actually have a publisher uh, this was, you know, it actually went through the correct channels. So it's really nice to be able to hand that to people here and see that reaction. Well, I think you have two divergent ways to go. You could capitalize on the success that you've had, throw together a book, cash grab it, and it's out. And people be like, eh, and they throw it off to the side. But guess what? You're going to be making some money on it because people have already bought into you and they've used that. A perceived relationship just to buy because it's something out there or the way you did it you and we've talked about this before your name is your brand yep. is your reputation so it's important that everything you're going to put out from a book or not just flooding the market with rubs or just throwing out sauces or whatever mm -hmm. everything that you attach your name to you believe that that is representation uh, represent representing you and you want it to be the best form of you you're putting out there. And that's kind of where it is with this book. It only takes one time to disappoint people before they've lost trust in your brand. And whether that be, you know, it's true for a restaurant, right? Like there's very, it's very unlikely that you will give a restaurant another chance once they disappoint you once. So you mm -hmm. have a good meal, then you have a bad meal and you're probably going to stay away. It, it's the same philosophy that I have with my rubs too. I don't want to just put out or, or the steak fork that I'm importing or I've got some new knives in the works. I don't want to just put out a product because I've now built a brand and can easily just stamp it on a bunch of different things. You know, whether it's the slogans of the t-shirts or making sure it's like good quality hats or whatever it is. It's, it's like, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm building stuff that if, if you commit to spending your hard earned money on something that I've created, I'm not going to let you down. When you are hyping the book, um, I don't recall, except over the last couple of years, seeing such an importance running up the book before it's released, the Amazon pre-sale, Amazon pre-sale. I want to be pre-sale number one this and you know get me in this section. Is that something that the publisher tells you, hey, when we know we're going to be X amount of time away or that it's going to be available for pre-sale, that you have to get out there and really promote it? And how is that helping you like with a next book or uh, real transactional sales after the book is released? It's, it's, I think next opportunity comes from real transactional sales after the book is released. Uh, and the pre-sale, there's different things, you know, like I've been told by my, my publisher and my literary agent that you shouldn't start more than a month out because people are going to lose interest. And something really interesting happened as well. I felt like I was pushing pre-orders hard. And then what? The day that it happened, the day that the book came out, it spiked. Like it's incredible how many people are not comfortable with the idea of ordering in advance and they want it to be available at the time they pull the trigger. Yeah, those are the old people. <laughs> <laughs> old school. Yeah, right. Yeah. So uh, I think that you're just taught it's, 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 you know, Amazon is such a power player in this world and everyone still tries to figure out the algorithm just like we try to figure out Instagram mm -hmm. or whatever it is. And it's generally considered that the more work you do on the back end before it comes out it has direct correlation to how well it does and how how much they keep it up in their, you know, in their charts once it is out. Is it a true test to see where your benchmark of popularity is? You can go on your Instagram account or, you know, a lot of these social medias and see what your statistics are. But if you're putting out a book, maybe there's a whole faction of people that are kind of uh, silently watching you on the internet and maybe they haven't friended you or followed you. And now this book is out. You can see from a statistical standpoint, you know, those books take off. Um, does that validate you at all to see the book maybe exceed expectation? It's, it's, I think the book makes other people more comfortable. It's now making other people like, oh, I see. She's kind of like doing things in the field. I mean, I got to tell you, you know, I cooked in Brazil last year and Sweden last year, spoke at the American Meat Science Association conference. We'll be speaking at Beef Australia. Like I am fortunate enough that I am luckily recognized in my field as someone who's equipped to talk about certain things and I'm invited to classes and speaking engagements and, you know, 
I have a smoker with my name on it. I'm a CEO of a company, all this stuff. And yet still there were people who were like, oh, well, you're a blogger. And so now it's like this legitimate thing. I'm very proud of the book and I'm very excited it's out. But in some ways it's a little frustrating that you can do so much and it still takes that book to be considered legitimate in other people's eyes. So is there another one in the works or was this a a one-off at this point? Uh, well, I mean, you know, when you sign a book book deal, they always put an option in there. So the next step will be figuring out if that's right for both both parties, and if not, you can also shop it around to someone else. But again, I'm 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 referencing Amy Mills here. She took 12 years between books because exactly what we've said. I don't want to just put another one out for the sake of it. If I do a number two, and I certainly hope that I do, it'll be as thoughtful uh, and intentional as the first one. So that may take some time. There, there is a group women that are out there that get your book. They like you. They dig the fact that you're kind of brutally honest and that me, yes. <laughs> um, and, and you'll you will give your opinion whether somebody's going to appreciate it or not. Um, from a host perspective, I w- would always rather have somebody that's going to come on and say, "This is what I think" or "This is what I know," and back up whatever the argument is, allow me to contend with them if I disagree. And then at the end, we part ways, everything is good, and I can't wait for the next time. Uh, The internet has also been littered with people that we either are going to think alike or we just hate each other. Mm -hmm. My daughters get that book. And they read it, and my uh, old, my middle daughter, fifteen years old, you know, she's going through. She's already started picking out recipes that we're going to try together. So. This is just from a personal testimonial here. At least two out of the three daughters in my house, because my volleyball players, she's an eater, but the other two <laughs> take active interest in cooking. So they'll eat. She she will eat what they ended up cooking. But you know, you are inspiring a younger generation to not only cook but get into the live fire cooking aspect of it. I'm wondering how many testimonies you're getting of similar fashion. Yeah, I had, you know, even Shauna won the steak cook off last night. A woman won that. And I interviewed her briefly for the live stream here. And she was just saying, you know, we're just trying to get more girls into it. I, I stepped into it when her, she stepped into it when her, her dad couldn't make a couple of things that he prepaid for. And now she's trying to encourage other women into it. And I think it's, I think it's amazing. I've always kind of said, you know, and, and when you got the book, you tweeted like this, this is making the girls in the household. They grabbed it right from me. <laughs> and and that's everything. I try not to make it about gender in that it's this. Whoever wrote that book, I think it's a damn good book. Right. If it happens to be a woman that then inspires other girls to realize it's not about whether you're a man or a woman. It's just about working hard and doing a damn good job. That's what I want to do. That's what I hope to promote. And yeah, there were stories like that coming out. I swear that what you tweeted that it that it resonated so much at home meant more to me than a lot of other acolytes. Fifteen years ago, if I'm talking to Jess Pryle's new book <laughs> author, you know, people were making livings writing books. Mm. And now you look at it 15 years later, where we're here in 2018. And I've talked to uh, you know Meathead and Ted Reader and Stephen Reichlin and Dr. Barbecue and well known Chris Lilly. I mean, you name it. Um, all these guys have written books. All these girls have written books, gals, ladies. And it just seems like at this point, books haven't gone away. Cookbooks, for whatever reason, seem to be stronger than ever. That's like the reference thing you want to be able to go into the kitchen and pull out and you want to have it sitting right next to you. Uh, some of the other stuff might have fallen off a little bit, but definitely from a, a recipe book standpoint, that has really stood the test of time. Mm. Can you make money at book writing or is it a way to continually keep your face, your name, your brand out, but just kind of in, a, in another venue? I, I mean, and this is a great question for folks who are wondering about or curious themselves. So the first thing is, you know, do you have a publisher or are you self-published? Okay, if you're self-published, you're taking care of your own stuff here. The world of publishing is so different, and it depends hugely on the contract you get. Are you paying for your photographer yourself? Are you not? What's your deal? What's your percentage? How many do you have to sell before you start getting more than that advance that you're given? Mm-hmm. I think unless you're... uh on the scale of someone like Chris Lilly, you know, who obviously they wouldn't give him an opportunity to put out more books if he was not selling the hell out of those books. Right. You know what I mean? 
Uh, for me, it's again, it's lovely because it's a it, it it's lovely to share that with a new audience because people do like cookbooks and they may not have purchased something else in the line. But for me, it's a, it, it, at this point, it's another piece of merchandise. Um, it's not anything that makes me significantly more money as something else. Maybe at the but you know, I'm speaking too prematurely, and at the end of this interview, it'll just spike again. And of course, it, yeah, you know, I mean, you don't know. Maybe it'll it may even exceed my expectations. And if that happens, and if you start really selling like Meathead, if you become a New York T- Times bestseller, now you're in a different sphere. I like to tell people to think of it like music you know like like signing a record deal because i think a lot of people at least more familiar with that where it's like you can sign a record deal and you have to be real careful about the deal you sign and who you're with and what the distribution is and it's the same thing and you may not hit on it not everyone has the kings of leon first album you know where it just goes and goes and goes and then they may not have a successful second one too so it really takes you either being a huge name who can sell that volume or you just have this standout like incredibly successful book that propels itself and that's when you make real money on a book uh you're here at mbbqa doing a book signing Uh, i know you've been doing some other like breakout classes uh in those regards what are you actively taking part in and uh teaching while you're here Uh, So I did a presentation yesterday actually on beef myth busting because it's the same thing. Like I really enjoy feeling that niche of science-based approach to cookery um, and barbecue. So uh, that's what I did yesterday. did the signings today, did a little bit of that live stream, got classes coming up. You can always hit my website. There's an events page on there now because – I'm fortunate enough again that, you know, this time last year I was like maybe booking one or two things in advance. Mm -hmm. And now I'm like booking into October, which is insane, but amazing. It is good. So I've got all that up there now for people. What's your take on MBBQA? I'm looking at it. um, I I talked to a bunch of people before I came out and it was probably 65 to 70% on the schneid and 25 to 30% saying, yeah, you know, it's awesome. It's good. And, uh, I never like to buy into one side or the other if I'm excited enough to come down and check it out for myself so I can draw my own conclusion. Then that's what I would like to do. So I was motivated enough to come down and Meathead kind of sponsored me down here to, mm-hmm. to help me out, which is why I'm wearing this really cool t-shirt. It's super cool. Um, but I'm, I'm still trying to figure out, like, is it more of an industry thing where I it's better for me if I'm a retailer or if I'm building grills or if I'm running a restaurant to some degree? So I have access to a lot of these really big names in the industry. Mm. Or if there's some way that you can connect a fan like me or a fan of you because I know you're going to be here. And Can it make sense to draw both sides of that? market in here and and make it a successful national barbecue and grilling association not necessarily just reflective of the industry or maybe that's just what it is so the first thing is to just look at what's happening every year because they grow and they try new things and this year you know that grilling academy is a new concept for them so it it, it's an attempt to be industry-based for the first couple of days and then public-based today uh So it remains to be seen what they're going to activate next year. But here's what I'll say. All of the sessions aside, it is invaluable. It's invaluable for the public to come down because you will never have opportunity to meet the kind of names that come to this thing where they have the time to talk to you. They're not doing a comp. They're not, you know, they don't have three seconds to take a photo with you. You can actually spend time and visit with them. You can see what's going on. So that's, that's a luxury from an industry perspective. If nothing else, if you don't go to any session while you're here, the networking opportunities to have everybody in this space at once are second to none. They really are. To be able to connect with, you know, Ace Hardware here is a major sponsor. You, you have a rub right. brand and you get to get FaceTime and even get the chance to say, what's the best address I can send you so- to something right. rather than trying to hope your email gets through the right person. You know, was that not worth was that not worth it alone? Yeah, right. So I, I think, you know, and the opportunity also to have, you know, people like yourself here, every time that we get any kind of media exposure, it should never be taken for granted. And, and you know, that's been really nice for me too. It's refreshing from my perspective to have 
an organization, even, I mean, is, is it like palatial studios? No, but they actually cordoned off a portion of their facility to allow myself and barbecue war stories and best barbecue show to all come down. And at least from a coverage standpoint, they get it right. They know we're going to come out. Some guys are going to be live streaming an incredible amount. Uh, I'm not too much into that. Um, I'd rather go get the recorded sound so I can polish it up a little bit. But everybody here that's covering it is doing it. Because you have a brand to protect, Greg Rambe. Correct. I want to sound a certain way, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it was refreshing to see somebody not go, "Eh, I don't know if we want to have a live stream three days uh, you know, while you're here. or We don't really know what podcasting is. Even if they didn't, they're doing a really good job at hiding that and also showing that they think that there's value in that. So they're uh, they they are. It's exactly what you said. Even if they don't necessarily know the vehicle, they are aware that it's evolve or die. And there's so much new technology out there. And they've done an exceptional effort about trying to make sure that a live stream happens, that you guys are accommodated, all that kind of stuff. Did you know that Mike Mills' first business was dentures? No, <laughs> I did not know that. Did you know he still owns that business today? Started in 1962. I also was not aware of that. And it's also two miles down the road from 17th Street Barbecue. <laughs> yes, that was a revelation on uh, Thursday when I talked with him. Is it? Does he have a? a is it kind of like running a little bit of a raw? You chip your teeth on a on a bone, rib bone and you head down for some dentures. Um, he he was saying that if you got a set of his, he called them falsies, but if you got a set of dentures from him and then you went down to eat at 17th Street you would feel very safe on both regards that the dentures were made right. However, if you got a little aggressive or uh, they were a little soft, the way he makes his ribs are just nice enough. So you don't have to put too much force. They just come right off the bone. So either way you're a winner, but that was his backup plan. That's amazing. Besides barbecue and he still has it today. So (laughs) I don't know how many people know that. So that was like my revelation for the week. And then the the next day I'm talking with Linda Orson. Mm -hmm. She reveals She's a professional clown. Nah. Yes. Nah. Like, did she clown. go to clown college? I don't know That's if she went thing. to clown college, but she was self admitted. I was a clown, um, and she had a spe- specific name for it. It wasn't like say, the red with name? the shoes or whatever. But, but does she have a clown name? Did you get into that? She didn't say Ooh. the name, but Ooh, we might have to have a chat with her. Later. I know. So uh, th- those were like the two biggest revelations of <laughs> the week for me that. Mike Mills sells dentures still, <laughs> and that Mama Shed is a clown. It's you've, you've a literal clown. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was trying to ask the right questions. A um, couple more questions here before I let you go, and I appreciate the time. I was talking with Chris Lilly yesterday, and here you see a lot of big names, and the biggest names have children, and their children are now in that business. Putting yourselves in their shoes, and I guess kind of translating whatever your internal makeup is to them, if you could do that. Would you want to be in the same business if your dad was Chris Lilly or if your dad was Myron Mixon um, or if your dad was Sweet Baby Ray, for instance? I mean, these are large trees casting big shadows with big footsteps. And I don't think, or uh, Amy Mills, Mm -hmm. if we're going to use those examples. um, Mike told me, hey, I never pushed amy or his son son never took an interest he lives on the left coast but amy kind of bought in at some point and and now the team is undeniable Mm. but he never wanted to push her into it he wanted her to find that value uh same with chris Uh, he's like i never wanted them i told them to get away and they kind of came back on their own would you want to be involved in that kind of a shadow where i have to imagine whether it's been vocalized or not you're looking at those kids, and there's a different set of standards and a different set of eyeballs when you're looking at Chris Lilly's kids because you never want to look at it as them getting a pass or them not having to put in the work because of who his dad is. It's a really good one. I think that – here's what I think. It's definitely intimidating, and I can't actually speak to it because I've never been in that position, but what I'd imagine it to be is this, that – it's a family business. And for someone like Myron Mixon, who's third generation, and Michael comes in, he's fourth generation now. And you, Ken Black, same thing. Like their family is generational barbecuers. So it's not just about can you be the next Myron Mixon. It's can you continue the family business of barbecue. So for a lot of people, it's just a, a, a pride thing. You know, 
whether it's that your dad ran a car dealership and that's going to be yours one day because that's what we do in the family. So I don't think it's necessarily about or, or cattle ranchers. You know what I mean? Like this is what our family does. This is what I'm going to do. And your daddy may have been a better roper than you, but doesn't mean you're not going to go in and do do as good a job as you can. So I think that there's a tremendous amount of pride. I think it's a great idea that they, uh, you know, it, do that kind of rum springer thing of go off and make <laughs> right. sure you want to do this because you certainly don't want to force anybody into it. You're going to have much more passion and uh, by it being a voluntary choice. Uh, but I, I think they go in and try and honor the work that came before them. And if they do as good or even better a job, then even better. Uh, where can everybody get your book, Jess? Uh, obviously, Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com. You can get a, signed copies on HardcoreCarnivore.com. Uh, and if your local bookstore doesn't stock it, you can certainly ask them to because it's available to them. Can we give one away on the show? Yes. Yes, we can. All right. I'll give that away as we... Uh jump into the Jason Ganahl segment. Perfect. Uh, all right, uh, JessPriles.com. Check it out. You uh, know where she is on social media. I really appreciate you, uh, really appreciate you taking the time out to uh, do this with me. You bet. Live and in person. I know. It's so fun. And thank you. And thank you for all you do as well. well you're, doing, you're doing important stuff, sharing our stories. This is my pleasure. Jess, thanks so much. All right, that was Jess Priles. JessPriles.com. Get the book if you haven't. And then also go to the website if you are interested at all in dry aging and read the definitive post on dry aging. Jason Ganahl coming up from GQ Barbecue here in a second. I want to talk to you quickly about AmazingRibs.com, the Pitmasters Club. Come on, folks, where for $24, maybe even a little less, definitely less than $25, but where for less than $25 a year, not a month, a year can you get access to some of the most high level high level information you can get advice from people that might not be at your level that might be at your level that might be way above your level now you have a confluence of information that you can decide to do whatever you want with you have a well-rounded scope of input you can check out all of the. Uh, I just turned my microphone down. Sorry, that was a. Oh, sorry, sorry. You can uh, check out all of the different kind of options that they have as far as uh, forums and uh, all that other cool input. I've even heard rumors that Meathead is going to be releasing certain chapters of his brand new book which according to last Tuesday is already a name change. It was going to be, the first one was the art and science of barbecue and grilling. Wait, no, it was the, the science of barbecue and grilling. And then the follow book was going to be the art of barbecue and grilling. But Meathead had uh, confirmed that that name change has is, is already happened. So I forget what he said it was going to be. Whatever. Go to amazingribs.com and then go ahead and check out the Pitmasters Club. Again, $24 a year? A year, not a month. Great access, great information. And one of the big reasons that I am right here at the National Barbecue and Grilling Association's National Convention. Also, thanks to National Barbecue and Grilling Association for uh, allowing me to set up here in the green room, as they're calling it, and do these uh, live three-hour shows each day. All right, we will reload with Jason Canal from GQ Barbecue. Stick around. We'll be right back.
Now's the time where we give stuff away. People give us stuff on the show to give away at no money for you. That's why it's free. Send an email on its way when I tell you to. That's why we give stuff away. Big name interviews, advice on cooking brisket and ribs, and the only host willing to share his honest opinion on all things important in the world of barbecue, it's the Barbecue Central Show. just be the telephone, right? So you would talk to people on the telephone, and you had no idea what they looked like when you met them. Right. So oftentimes you would get this visual after talking with them, um, what they would look like when you meet them for the first time. And I remember being a sales rep uh, in my early 20s, and I had a boss, and I hadn't met him for eight, eight months, 10 months or so, and we've had, we talked hours on the phone, uh, multiple times a day for eight months. And, and I thought I knew exactly what this guy looked like when I met him. He had this raspy voice, uh, deep uh, voice, and I was thinking I was going to meet this six foot four, 280 pound guy, right? <laughs> and I was so excited to meet him. I felt like I know the guy, but I, I had no idea what he looked like. And I walked in, and he was this uh, little Asian guy, probably about five foot eight and about 150 pounds. <laughs> so it totally caught me off guard. Mind blown. Uh, but I knew exactly what I was getting when I met you for the first time because we do those. We do. We've done your show four or five That's times, right. and I yep. see you on there. And uh, no surprises, you are exactly what you're like on the internet. <laughs> uh, Jason, you're here at NBBQA. What are you doing? Uh, from that perspective, you do some breakouts or are you just here visiting? What's the deal? So I was on the social influencer panel yesterday morning. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Uh, Michael from Code 3 Spices and Joey with B&B &B uh, &B Charcoal. We were on that this morning. And then also for me, this is the first time I've ever been to NBBQA. So it's a lot of fun getting to meet people that, that you're familiar with, just like you. You're yep. familiar with them, but you never met them in person. So it's fun to get to know them and uh, meet them. You were in yesterday, or were you here the night before? Uh, I got in uh, Wednesday, so I was here when it started. All right, so what's the overall take of it right now on your side? In terms of learning? Uh, I guess just of, like from an overall value. Well, I mean, what do, you, what do you get out of it? Well, it's barbecue is, I mean, it's a, it's a people business, right? Um, and I don't think there's any other place where you have such a diverse group of people. You can go to things like the Memphis in May. You can go things to things like 
the American Royal and you'll get the competition side of it and you'll get all the players in the comp world. But I can't think of a place where you can walk up and meet Sweet Baby Ray. You can walk up and meet Famous Dave. You can walk up and meet Chris Lilly. I mean, you get the comp side. You get the spice rub side. You get the business side. It's it's probably the the greatest collection of those people in one spot all year long. So it's been real valuable to meet those people. And I haven't met all the people I want to, but today I'm going to try to get around and meet them all. Yeah, it was going to be one of my questions was, you know, if you're going to be Jason Goodall fanboy, who are you going to be trying to chase down and have a conversation with? All of them. <laughs> Every single one. Wow. Yeah. Do you need any introductions? I'm pretty famous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, I want to try. I mean, that's 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 what's real valuable about this is the opportunity to meet all those people and uh, just to let them know that if they're ever in Denver and uh, they're looking for barbecue, that they have a place they can come hang out. Jason, let's uh, start there. Let's roll back just for a few minutes. If somebody's bumping over on the stream and they're not familiar with you or they've kind of heard about you um, cursorily, but they don't know you intimately. Um, where are you from originally? Like what's the whole background in live fire cooking and grilling? Is that something you got into later in life? Did you come from a family that was all about that? What's the deal? Yeah. So born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, my parents still live there and I lived there till I was about 30 years old. And I have, I'm 42 now, and uh, I have very vivid memories of cooking on a Weber kettle with my dad as a kid. And pork steaks are really popular back in St. Louis, which is just sliced pork butt uh, shoulder. And so I have very vivid memories of him cooking that on his Weber kettle with his towel on his uh, side pocket, kind of halfway out. And Malls is a popular barbecue sauce, which I've, I've heard that they might be discontinuing it this year. Have you heard that? I heard no. they were going to discontinue it, stop making it. And then there was such an uproar that I think they decided to keep keep making it. Really? Yeah. I don't, I don't know all the details on that. Maybe somebody will chime in and, and update us on that. But I, I remember him just um, basting it with natural light beer as it cooks. And then when it's done, he finishes it with the I used the to malls. baste my liver with natural <laughs> light beer. <by> the way. <laughs> I still do. <laughs> And uh, and putting it, finishing it with uh, Mall's barbecue sauce, and that's, I mean, we ate that, I mean, every single weekend we were out there on the kettle. So I've always enjoyed meat. I've always enjoyed barbecuing, and that was barbecuing to us, not the big cuts of meat or anything like that. And then hot dogs and hamburgers and things like that, nothing too elaborate. And then I ate barbecue all the time. Uh, back, back then, I mean, there wasn't the popular places that there are now. So I remember eating at Bandana's probably two or three times a week, which is a chain in uh, that area. But now you've got a lot of popular places uh, in St. Louis. But when I moved, those weren't there. And I moved out to uh, California for work. I was out there for about a year or so. And then work took me to the Boulder area. And I was uh, that was 10 years ago. And uh, I had a home-based business. I had a recruiting firm for the medical device industry. And I had to find something to do on the weekends. I was going crazy uh, being home all week working and then just being home on the weekends. And so in St. Louis, and I'm not a barbecue snob, just cook the meat well, see, don't over season it, don't over sauce it, and I like it, right? So St. Louis, I could get my itch scratched with barbecue all over the place. California, I found a couple places I liked a lot. When I moved out to Denver, I had a hard time finding a place. So I stumbled across the internet and discovered the Kansas City Barbecue Society, and they put on these professional barbecue contests. And I thought, this is great. I can go judge barbecue on the weekends, and I can find good barbecue, right? Because these are contests, right? But a lot of people don't tell you, you also get a lot of bad barbecue. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> so we can go and judge, and I can also get out of the house, right? So I, I became a, a judge and uh, judge for about two or three years, and then just a competitive person by nature. I uh, thought, uh, you know, I want to give this competition thing a try. And we competed for about four or five years. And then you get to meet a lot of people. And I noticed there was a lot of guys out there that were very successful in the restaurant world. And I just thought, well, why not? You know, if they can do it, why, why can't I do it too? And uh, we opened up a restaurant. And we've been open for about two and a half years. And um, I'm proud to say that we've signed a lease for a second unit. So we'll be opening up a second unit uh, later this year. And I'm also opening up a ice cream shop right next door to the second unit too. Really? So we're going to be making uh, homemade ice cream on the site uh, right there as well too. So that's that's going to be fun being a not only a multi-unit, but a multi-concept uh, operator as well also. Let's track back to the competition side of things. After you take, or did you just attend a competition or two to decide if you were really wanted to get into it? Or did you know that there was one going to be happening? You just signed up and said, hey, we're going to, throw caution to the wind and see how we do and go from there. So I was judging. So I got to know a lot of the cooks. And after the 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 
the judging. I'd walk around and I get to know them. So I, I had a pretty good idea what I was getting myself into. But still, even knowing that, I still remember my first contest, Pueblo, Colorado, I don't know, seven, eight years ago. I thought all I needed was a smoker and a table. I didn't have any lights at night, so I'm working in the dark. <laughs> I didn't have anything to sleep in, take a nap. I didn't have any of that kind of stuff. And uh, I remember um, I was they put me on the far end, so you have all these teams with trailers and pop-up <laughs> tents and all that. And all I had was a table and an FEC 100. <laughs> That's it. And uh, I even had guys – I had two different people come up, and they thought I was security right there at the end asking if I could move the barricade so they can drive – drive through that's how nondescript my my setup was for the very first comp but we did fine we got two calls that day and then after that i mean a lot of people are coming up and uh just introducing themselves and stuff too so uh that was my that was my first first competition fast forward through that competition career and you did see some success um especially out there in the, in the colorado area, considered one of those top teams in the rocky mountain area probably west coast just in general how did you or how have you seen the competition world change from when you started to where we are here in 2018? Obviously, you're not uh, anywhere near out as much as you were due to the uh, restaurant responsibilities. But I'm sure you keep tabs and talk about trends and stuff. And I just wonder what your take is on it. Yeah, I mean, a lot of my friends still compete. And I try to judge once a year. So I will try to get out to one contest and judge once a year. I, I, I love competition barbecue. I mean, the flavor, the taste of it. So I just really enjoy eating uh, the different entries for the different people. Um, it seems like what I'm hearing from most people, there's a there's a couple of different things that I think are 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 frustrating the the comp cooks. Um, one is I, I think the the table of deaths, which are have always been there, and then also the angel tables, which a lot of people don't talk about as much. I think there's uh, people th assume or think that there could be a way to get around that, and uh, it doesn't necessarily get addressed. So I, I know that's, for a couple of people, a big issue. And the rising costs uh, also is, is a problem. And uh, you also have things like the state cook-off uh, where you can do that for one day at a fraction of the cost. So there's a lot of downward pressure on the traditional KCBS contest that I think things have to, I, I don't feel like there's as many people getting into it now as there were seven, eight, nine years ago. I mean, I, I, I know because the number of comps in our area are decreasing as well as the number of participants are, are a lot less than what they used to be. So if you didn't get into the restaurant business, would you say that your interest in competition barbecue, I'm, you're speculating, of course, but mm -hmm. why not? It's my show. Um, do you think you would have trended down as well? Or would you have taken on the responsibility of potentially having to travel more to do the same amount or more competitions than you would year after year? Yeah. So for me, I also have this other uh, responsibility called a family. What's that? <laughs> so I've got four kids and a wife, and that was the big thing for me too is when I was competing, uh, my kids were uber little, super tiny. Now they're you know five and eight, and they all have weekend activities and stuff. So no, I don't see myself being out there. And in the Rocky Mountain area, the most contests we can do – is about 15 to 17 unless you want to take two-day drives. So even if uh, I, I, I didn't have all these other obligations because of my children's events and things like that, I couldn't see myself doing maybe three or four contests a year. So now we're a successful barbecue restaurant. You go through the opening. Um, you know, I still remember those initial conversations that we had. <laughs> we're kind of tracking you, and you're like, I'm mortgaged to the hilt. I'm maxed out on this, but everything, we're going to do this. And my wife is on board, luckily. Otherwise, who knows what would have happened if uh, things would have went south. But it didn't. that was not the case. Things are really good. They started out great. They've continued. You're going to be opening up a second location and an ice cream uh, store, by the way. So... I'm wondering, as you see it two and a half years later, um, evaluate the success that you've had up to this point, and then how do you continue it going three and four and ten years down the road? Yeah, it's it's a blur. Even hearing you say two and a half years, it doesn't even feel like that. I mean, I, I remember the first three months of it, and I don't, I don't even have vivid memories of what it was like the first three months. And I remember having the conversation with with my wife, and I said, I just, I need, I need three months where I just, I can't, I, I, I need to be there for three months. And I was getting up going in there at six in the morning and uh, getting home at nine at night. And she was a great partner in that and allowed me that time to do that. And then we could start hiring different people to do different things. 
Um, but I, I don't have that answer. I, I, I can't guarantee success. I'm taking all, all, all of our profits that we're making and I'm putting the chips back into the middle of the table and I'm hoping we win again. And I, and I have no idea. I've accepted already that there'll probably be some dilution in terms of quality. I mean, I, I feel like when I can go in there, uh, I have a good control and a good feel for uh, the customer's, um, I guess, perception and um, their experience. But when I'm not there, I have no idea and I rely on other people. And when you rely on other people, you don't necessarily always get the, you get what they want you to think, right? Versus what's really going on. But what's helpful is nowadays you've got so many online review sites and I've gotten to know my customers so well because I'm in there every single day for lunch. Now it's Monday through Friday for lunch that they're texting me and they're letting me know what's going going on. And I have, I have the absolute best team right now. They are, they are so good. And I know 100% that if we can just, if I could clone all of them and put them in the new shop, we would, we would be great. But that's my biggest fear is just finding the, the new group of people that can keep our culture. And if we can do that, we're going to, we're going to be great. But I've already kind of accepted a little bit of uh, dilution in terms of just uh, consistency, but it would be great if that doesn't happen, if we can achieve the same results that we achieve at our first one. I'm a control freak. Uh, that's why you see no extra help here. Uh, I think two shows out of all the shows I've ever done, I had my oldest daughter sit here and like do the flashes in between scenes. And uh, I was, I guess, well, as I Dr. Phil it back, I was just you know thinking that she would be able to anticipate, do a drum roll here, do an air horn here, <laughs> do this transition here. I never explained it to her. And then, you know, when it didn't happen, I was like, why aren't you doing this? And I'm like, okay, second show, you're fired. I'm going to go back to doing it myself. And, and that's why I'm here today. I feel most comfortable with me hosting, producing, booking, and prepping the show because I can count on me. I think I would fail miserably opening a restaurant because I inherently hate every single person that walks the face of the earth and I distrust them. So how do you work past that? Because you have to be, this is your money. This is your responsibility. This is your livelihood at stake. And these people are coming in. I guess you're hoping they have the same kind of a passion to some degree as you do so they can have that buy-in. They want to get paid and maybe the job dries up or maybe somebody down the street offers them 75 cents more. That's got to be a continual reconciliation on your part and probably your wife's part on what's going to happen this week or what's going to happen this month. Yeah. And, and that's, that was a, a hard thing for me to do. And uh, you just, you <laughs> I'm, have I'm to. nervous for you that you're here by the way. Yeah. So, <laughs> so it, it's, it's, I, I don't have, I mean, I don't have an answer for how you get over it, but I, I struggled with that. And uh, in the beginning, it's like, okay, do I want to become the, the best barbecue place when people come in and they say that was the best barbecue I, I've ever had. And in the beginning, I kind of thought that that's, what we wanted to, to be. But over time, it was just such a, a strain trying to be the best for everybody. And so what I realized is I don't have to be the best barbecue that anyone's ever had. I just have to be the most convenient, the most consistent, where they're going to want to come in once every two weeks or three weeks for it, for it to work. And that was hard as, as a competitive person, as somebody who wants to always put their best foot forward. But once I was able to accept a person saying, oh, it was okay, but it wasn't great or anything like that. Uh, it made my ability to get through the day a lot better because I wasn't trying to please everybody, just trying to please a majority of people, but not trying to be the best, just to be very good to everybody. Does your flavor profile mimic what you would have done on the competition trail, or did you go in a more consumer-friendly style? So my, my belief is restaurant flavor profile is a little bit different from competition. Competition, there's um, a couple more steps involved, right? So we're not, I mean, we're not injecting briskets. We're not injecting pork bucks. I would have injection all over the kitchen <laughs> if we were doing that kind yeah, of right. stuff, right? Um, but uh, again, it's, it's I, if you're a, I mean, I, I like to use sports analogies. So if you're a golfer, we're just trying to hit the fairways every single time. So if we can please four out of five pallets with something kind of middle of the road, we, we don't sauce anything. We put sauce on the table and let people uh, sauce it. And we just use our rub. I mean, literally we use one rub, the rub uh, on all of our meats. That's it. So we keep it pretty simple. We want, if you're eating pork butt, you should be tasting pork first. We don't want to over season anything. If you're tasting brisket, it should be beef first. It should be what shines through, not a whole bunch of rub or anything like that. So we just try to like just hit the fairways and uh, don't try to get too extreme one way or the other. But we do put a competition glaze 
uh, on the ribs. Uh, we put that honey brown sugar butter comp traditional comp glaze uh, on, on the ribs, and we we try to be different from other barbecue places in that regard. But we don't get too extreme by doing like blueberry barbecue sauce or anything like that. Is there a definitive Denver style barbecue, or are you blazing? and creating whatever that Denver barbecue profile might turn out to be. When I think of Kansas City style, I mean, Texas, I, I associate with like Central Texas, right? And Austin Lockhart, when I think of Texas barbecue, and I think a lot of people say there's different styles even in Texas. Yep. But that stuff doesn't happen quickly. That's generational, right? Uh, Colorado, I mean, Denver style, I, I, it seems to me a lot of the food writers are searching for that. I see a lot of articles where they talk about that. And I, I tell people we get asked that a lot, and we just cook competition. We, we try to do things as closely as we can without injecting and without a couple of the steps. But we try to mimic those flavors because the rub was exactly the same one that we used in competitions. But we try to cook what I call competition uh, quality food in our restaurant. Um, we're not trying to do a, a certain style. Um, lamb is pretty popular in Denver and Colorado, so some places – uh, we'll cook lamb, and they kind of call that a Colorado kind of thing. But I, I don't think there is a certain style. And, and even if there was something we're trying to do, it would take, you know, a couple different – it would take a concerted effort and a generation or so to establish a true Colorado-style barbecue. But what we do have is we got a lot of people moving to Denver from St. Louis, from Kansas, from Texas, and they're bringing their styles with them. So we have this good hodgepodge of – People from different parts of the country all cooking what they know how to cook. And uh, I, I put Denver barbecue up against, I mean, there's seven or eight places that I put them up against, seven or eight places from any city, and uh, it, it's fantastic. So is it more of a fact that where you have a, a media, no offense, Kale, uh, you have a media population out there that wants to, so they're catching on that barbecue uh, from a restaurant standpoint or in the backyard is still continuing the, to skyrocket in popularity and they know the Carolinas and they know Memphis and they know Texas and they know Kansas City. So they feel they need to pull some kind of a label off the five standard meccas and place it everywhere else. So, you know, like uh, uh, Michael Simon says, we have a Cleveland based barbecue. Daniel Vaughn disagrees with that totally. You're in Denver. <laughs> so that's why I ask about a Denver style uh, barbecue, whatever that means. Is Are people just trying to place labels somewhere so they have a starting reference point to figure out how it's actually going to end up being when it's all said and done? Uh, my, my belief is people just like to judge and evaluate. So they want to have something they can judge and evaluate you against. So that's why they want to know, what is this? Okay, uh, okay, I know Kansas City barbecue. Let me judge you against my favorite place in Kansas City. But that, that can only lead to disaster half the time, it right? It does. I mean, if I had a nickel for every time somebody came in and said, I'm from, insert any southern state right here, and I know barbecue. <laughs> right. <laughs> So you're an expert because yeah. you were just born or you're from a certain state and right. you eat it. That makes you a default expert, right? So, And, and I also believe, too, um, you're never going to be as good as somebody's favorite barbecue from back home. You just got to be the best around in that area. And uh, that's that's what I think. And, and people get frustrated when we say, oh, no, it's we're competition barbecue. We're, it's our background. It's what we know. Uh, and then you got to explain what that is because they're unfamiliar with that, but they get a little frustrated and people love, I mean, we, we've been open two years and we've already been reviewed over a thousand times on the internet and people love to review and judge you and stuff like that. So I think they come in, they want to know, okay, what are you, what style are you? So I can judge you right away. And I think that's what drives a lot of that. Are you really active on monitoring a Yelp or a Google review? And if so, are you the type of people that will respond back with, hey, I'm sorry, or do you say, or do you have somebody that says, sorry, this happened, please write me at blah, 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 at gqbarbecue.com. I have some follow-up questions that I want to ask you about. What's the method there? So every night about 8.30, not at, not about, every night at 8.30, I put my oldest kid to bed, and I go pour myself a glass of wine or a beer. <laughs> I open up the laptop, and I check the day's sales, <laughs> and I check all the online reviews. And I respond back to every single person, whether it's a positive one or it's a negative one. I do it a little bit differently than a lot of the other ones that I see that are out there and that I try to do everything privately. Um, I, I believe that there are an element of people out there that are just fishing for uh, free food. So if, I think that if you're replying publicly, offering people free food, you tend to get more negative reviews uh, because people set a precedent exactly because they want a free meal. So I yeah. just everything's <laughs> private, 
And uh, say thanks so much for coming in. Really appreciate it and for taking the time to, to leave a review. Or if it's negative, it's like, oh, wow, I'm so sorry to hear about your bad experience. Maybe you caught us on a bad day. Well, you dress whatever it is. And, right. you, and you try to just get him back in. But uh, that's, that's very important. I mean, this is a digital age. People are making decisions off what they see and find on here. Mm -hmm. That if you've got uh, a negative, um, if you leave a negative impression on people and there's enough people out there, that could, that could damage. I mean, so many people, first timers, when they come in, I say, how did you hear about us? Why did you come in? And they say, oh, you got great reviews on, online and stuff. So that, that drives so many new customers for us that, yeah, I, I'm very, very careful in monitoring all that kind of stuff. A lot of the barbecue restaurant owners that I know say that while it's great to spin the till in the shop and have good days in the shop, obviously important, <clears throat> that a big linchpin of their continued success, whether they're very young in the business of restaurant ownership or they're more mature, is they do a really good catering business. Profit's good, margin's good. Uh, easy to do because you can just drop it off and leave. You don't have a huge group of people coming in and taking up space in the brick and mortar shop. Uh, do you do a certain percentage or, or a larger percentage of catering versus the in-house or does it go the other way or a split? I remember Darren Worth told me something before we got going and he said, You're, you got to think of yourself as a catering business and your restaurant is just a tasting facility for people to come in and, and, and order catering for you. And, and, and he's right in that the profitability is there for catering. Um, you can have three, four thousand dollars go out the door before you open at eleven o'clock. That takes thirty minutes to put together versus taking five hours for three or four thousand dollars to come in and a lot more employees, right? So where we're at, we're in a, a suburb north of Denver. We're not around a lot of businesses. So Monday through Thursday, I don't get that big time business catering. On the weekends, yes. W weddings this year, we've already got probably 28, 30 weddings on the books wow. for, for this summer. And a, and a typical Saturday, we'll have nine or 10 caterings last year. So this year, I, I, I hope it'll go up. But where we're going, our second unit, I specifically found a place where we should get a lot of Monday through Thursday catering. In fact, my manager was at Chick-fil-A for 12 years before he started working uh, for us. And there's about 2,300 2,400 or so Chick-fil-A's all around the country. And the Highlands Ranch Chick-fil-A is the top 25 in the country in catering. Really? We are a quarter mile away from that Chick-fil-A wow. location. So I am expecting to get huge catering business from our, our next spot. And that was a big driver why, why we went down there. How far away is that from the flagship? <laughs> It's an hour. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I mean, you know, my thought is you don't want to be too close. You don't want to end up competing with yourself. I mean, even if that was a, a honey hole of catering, that might get more word of mouth than the the first one that started. And now you're, I don't want to say you're putting yourself out of business, but you're kind of, you know, robbing Peter and paying Paul. Yeah. A lot of people have different strategies on that. I mean, a lot of smart restaurant guys have said that, you know, you've got to go close because then you can borrow resources, whether it's labor, whether it's product, whatever from the store. Uh, and other ones have said just what you said, you don't want to cannibalize your, your other location. But for us, it was just, um, we wanted something that uh, was going to put us in a position where we can, you know, drive a lot of revenue through catering. And that's where the, the action is down, is down south, but it's so expensive uh to go down there so we're paying a big big rent so we got to deliver and execute let's talk about the ice cream shop yes what's that all about bar like ice cream goes good with barbecue or the kid said hey dad let's do a ice cream shop or uh, you're the first person i know that owns an ice cream shop. <laughs> <laughs> how many people no surprise by the way <laughs> <laughs> how many people have you met in your life that say i don't like ice cream Zero people. Exactly. So we're already starting with almost every single person out there is a potential customer, right? right? And uh, you see these different fads come and go, and there was like a frozen yogurt uh, one, but ice cream has always been around, just like barbecue. Barbecue has always been been around. And uh, I, I just think that it's uh, it, there's there's a place uh, where we live. It's a popular ice cream uh, place. I know the, the founder fairly well. And there's just always a ton of people outside. And it's the same thing when you just see something you're like, oh, I think we can do that. I think it'd be fun to try it. So we're going we're gonna to try it. And I'm really excited because uh, we found a dairy in Denver that makes awesome product. 
and they're going to be providing us the all the ingredients so we can make it all on site. So I'm super excited to source everything locally and I'm super excited to be making everything on site that I think we're going to have an awesome ice cream product. And from a business standpoint, the ice cream to me is a lot more scalable than than barbecue restaurants. So what ideally what I would like to do is get these things going where we can just open up ice cream shops, boom, 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 boom. Uh, we can do that a lot faster than we can open up barbecue restaurants, especially if you want the barbecue restaurants to be great. I would imagine that as far as staffing is concerned, that's got to be way easier to to staff, you know, a couple teenagers doing ice cream than it is, you know, stocking up pitmasters. I hope so. We'll find out. We'll find out. But the big thing for us is, I mean, we pay uh, well above uh, above average. Uh, we don't want people job hopping. We want people to come and stay stay with us. So we'll find out. I mean, we'll, we'll see, but I, I would think it would be easier too. But again, I talked to ice cream makers and they think it's when you're making it versus just paying somebody to bring it in, you get a lot of variance uh, with it. And I've talked to people that got out of it because they were having problems with getting consistency in their ice cream. You take a, a bite of cookies and cream and you have no cookie in it and your next bite has too much cookie. Um, so, so problems like that, right? So it's going to be first world problems. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It, they'll, they'll be all of those same things, but we'll, we'll figure it out. I mean, we, we, that's, we're, we're good at between, uh, you know, Nick, myself, and some of the other people, we're really good at figuring things out. So we'll figure out how to, how to make it work. So is it going to be custard or is it ice cream? So uh, being from the Midwest, I love custard. St. Louis, I mean, I, I could eat custard till I'm blue in the face. I, I loved it. And there's no custard out in Colorado at all. So I was like, perfect. And that was everything – uh, I had my heart on We're going to bring custard out here. It's going to be awesome. People are going to love it. Uh, and then as I started learning about uh, it, they throw custard out every, at night. It doesn't keep well the next day. Right. It's just like barbecue. And we, do, we don't want to reheat any of our barbecue the next day. We sell it all out the same day. I'm like, crap. It's going to be all the same headaches that we have in the barbecue place that we're going to have in the ice cream place. And you right? can't make like a custard Brunswick stew. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, after, you know, wrangling around that, with those different options for a while, we settled on just traditional ice cream, scooped ice cream. And what I think will be fun with that is we can come up with whatever different flavors we want. It can be really, really quick. I want us to be a high volume kind of place. We're going to be in a place where it's going to be a lot of foot traffic that I, I want people to get in and out really, really quickly and stuff. And so I didn't want to do like one of those, what is it, Cold Stone Creameries yep. where it takes three or four minutes. It's just like no scoop, serve, pay, gone. 45 seconds, maybe a minute if people want to sample two or three different things. Um, but yeah, so that was, custard was, I mean, where my heart was at until I, I learned a little bit more about it. And I never knew that. It's weird. I mean, I ate it for many years and I never knew that they threw it out uh, at the end of the night. Do you have a target number of ice cream flavor selections or is that also like a barbecue menu? You open the restaurant, you probably should stick to what you really do best, but then you kind of fall in love with offering 750,000 items and it kind of is a nightmare. Yeah. So what I'm doing right now is, is all of that kind of uh, research. So every, I go into barbecue or go into ice cream shops and I, what's your three best selling ice creams. And I, I've been asking that for the last six months in every ice cream place. So I got a list of about 48 flavors that, that we want to, that we want to do. Uh, but our bins, we've got eight uh, holes, right. For, the three gallon ice cream. So we're starting out with 16 and I think that's, that's plenty. Um, so we're going to, we're going to roll with 16 um, and see how it goes. You're going to make weed ice cream. <laughs> I just going to write that down real quick. Uh, cannabis. I heard you can do cream. that out there. <laughs> <laughs> that's right now. That's kind of trendy. A lot of weed different cream. chefs. Yeah. A lot of, a sh- lot of chefs cooking with uh, marijuana. So that's, it's actually a really good idea, Greg. <laughs> Is it? I don't know. That That's seems gonna go like on not a good idea. Yeah. Hey, dude, let's go down. What's the name of the place going to be? Ice Cream Farm. Ice Cream Farm. Let's go down to the ice cream farm, man. <laughs> get some weed ice cream, bro. Yeah. And then we'll go to GQ when we get hungry in an hour. <laughs> You're going to capture the whole market. It's going to be great. You'd be surprised how many of those guys come into the barbecue place. <laughs> oh, I bet. I bet. That's, that's some good snacking right there, right? You going to be uh, competing at all here coming up, or you you kind of out of that game at this point? Every year, I think I'm going to do two or three, and I and I never end up doing it. So it's been about three or four years, and even this year, you know, I, I'd like to get try my hand at a, a state cookoff uh, contest. But those are my friends that are out there, and I don't I don't get to see them like I used to. So uh, trying to do Facebook messages isn't the same as sitting sitting down and having two or three beers with them, you know, on a Friday night with cooking briskets and pork in the background. So I miss, I miss seeing a lot of those people. 
Um, but I, I know life's going to get in the way, um, and I probably won't do. In, I, in fact, this year I know we're not going to do two or three. There's just too many things going on with the opening those two new places. Jason Gnall from GQ Barbecue, doing it live right here, the National Barbecue and Grilling Association's uh, podcast slash internet radio TV studio. Great to meet you in person. Yeah. Great to see you. Thanks for having Appreciate me on. your uh, patronage to the show over the years, and we will obviously uh, stay in touch and continue to track the upward movement of uh, GQ and all its properties and ownerships. And Greg, I appreciate what you do, giving a platform to help allowing people like us to get out to new, new people too. So thank you for doing what you do. Thank you for saying that. That's Jason Ganahl, GQ Barbecue. We're going to step away real quick and reload. You are listening and watching Barbecue Central Show from the National Barbecue and Grilling Association's annual conference right here in Fort Worth, Texas. Stick around. We'll be right back.
is the time on the show where we give stuff away, yeah. It's free and you don't have to pay a thing, that's why it's free, yeah. All right, your chance to win a freshly minted Barbecue Central Show t-shirt. I have all of the barbecue sizes in stock, starting with extra large. Then we have two extra large. Then we have three extra, and we have four extra. All you have to do in order to win one of these hot new items on the apparel market today is send me an email and in the subject line, all you have to do is write BBQ Central Show Day 3. BBQ Central Show Day 3. And you can win a Barbecue Central Show t-shirt. Now, perhaps the mute button was on the last contest. That was going to be a Jess Pryles new book release prize. And we'll do that after we get this interview session done. But right now, you are up to win a Barbecue Central Show t-shirt. Be the first one in, and in the subject line, BBQ Central Show or Barbecue Central Show Day 3, and you could win a hot, new, freshly minted t-shirt. Thank you for downloading the Barbecue Central Show. The Barbecue Central Show is supported in part by these great sponsors. The Barbecue Guru. Oh, dear. You see, I had... um, Whatchamacallit. I thought I could, thought I had the old show in there. That's all right. Let's try it again, just for fun. BBQ Central Show Day 3. And you can win a freshly minted t shirt. Good luck. The only show giving you a monthly visit from a doctor of barbecue, a man actually named Meathead, the author of a barbecue Bible. Bloggers, reviewers, competitors, and manufacturers by the dozens. It's the Barbecue Central Show. Once again, here's your host, Greg Rempe. All right, welcome back. Thanks again to Jason Ganahl from GQ Barbecue. By the way, that's located in Denver, Colorado. So if you are in the, I don't think it's probably Denver City, but one of the suburbs, and you say Denver because that's like the nearest city, but probably really close to Denver. So if you are going to be in the Denver, Colorado area, or you are living in the Denver, Colorado, uh, Denver, Colorado area, and you never knew that there was really good barbecue in your general vicinity, you should look up the directions and get over to Jason's place, ASAFP, and check out what competition barbecue tastes like Denver style. And it's again, you know, I love asking the question, what's the style? Because some barbecue places open up and they are specifically trying to mimic a region that's currently existing. For instance, we serve Carolina style barbecue or we serve Texas style brisket or sausage. Or we have the best Kansas City style ribs, brisket and sauce. As I had mentioned to Jason, Michael Simon is trying to build his barbecue joint in Cleveland as Cleveland-style barbecue. And when I had had Daniel Vaughn from Texas Monthly out a couple years ago when it had first opened, that was a couple years ago, for crying out loud, I said, hey, is there a Cleveland-style barbecue? And he said, unequivocally at that point, no, it's it can't be. This is too much looking, smelling, tasting, preparing like Texas-style barbecue. Now, there are Polish sausage and some of the sides and some of these other items which you wouldn't find in a Central Texas or a Texas-style barbecue, just to be generic, that you can find at Mabel's in Cleveland. 
But by and large, it was very Texas-inspired. Then you have the guys like Proper Pig over on the west side of Cleveland and now on the east side in Menor that have no problem saying, we went down to Austin, we were in these parts of central Texas, we studied, we wanted to be able to produce a Texas-style barbecue up here in Cleveland so we can bring that method to our town. And they've been very successful at doing that. So I'm always interested to hear that conversation. I should have asked him about what a pitmaster means to him because he is a pitmaster of a team and also the pitmaster of the restaurant. And does he have a pitmaster in the restaurant? And is he a better cook than Jason? Can you ever be a better cook than the owner? Oh, boy. Now, that could be a dilemma. Congratulations to Leonard Aberman. Leonard Aberman is the winner of the shirt. Leonard, I can't even believe you won because you actually took time in the body of the email to write, I want to win. That's unbelievable. You could, you should never do that. If you are going to enter a contest, do exactly what I say. You're lucky this time, Leonard, and I'm very happy that you won. You beat out Doug Durda, and you beat out uh, the other guys that I just washed away. I forget his name. Anyway, if you are going to take part in a contest for me, do exactly what I say. In an email, in the subject line, put this subject line. Don't take the extra time to write in even one word or punctuation mark or character in the body of the email. You are taking a precious time. You could cost yourself a T-shirt for crying out loud, and we do not want that. We, and by we, I mean me, want you to win. So only do what I tell you. I'm not saying do the bare bones minimum, but in this instance, do the bare bones minimum. Just put in what I'm telling you in the subject line, giving you the best chance at winning the shirt. Now, luckily, Leonard won the shirt, so that's great. All right, uh, Diva Q is on the clock. Uh, I'm out to her. I have gotten no response. Uh, it's very busy here, a lot of... A um, lot of showing today, a lot of general public here today, so I'm not sure if she just forgot or, or what have you. I will choose to believe that she got busy and forgot instead of just blowing me off. I will not believe that. I refuse, and if I decide to believe it, it will only be under protest. You might be wondering what's happened here recently. I can give you a little bit of a recap. Yesterday... If you didn't watch the show and you haven't gotten the podcast, Chad from Kick Ash Basket was on. He let off the show in the first hour yesterday. And if you're not familiar with Kick Ash Basket, it is something that goes, it was originally made to go in a ceramic cooker that uses natural lump charcoal. So when you snuff out the fire, you close the bottom damper, you close the top damper, you have the ash that ends up collecting. The coals go out eventually, so now you can just take the grill grate off. You take the basket out, give it a shake. All the loose ash falls out from the bottom. Because he said it kind of looks like a, a an oversized golf ball bucket like you get at the driving range. So you shake the basket, the ash will fall out. Then you're ready to go. You can fire up the lump that's in there. Because remember, you can always use the relump after you've burned it once as long as it's out. So it's a very efficient way of getting the ash out, quick clean, you have the good stuff in there that you can continue to use. You light it up, and then away you go. Kickashbasket.com. Then in the second hour, we talked with Chris Lilly from Big Bob Gibson's. You know, Chris is still kind of a refreshing guest. He's very open. He's very accessible. I saw him around the stockyards after the show ended yesterday, and he is readily approachable, almost kind of looking to people to say, hey, I'm not unapproachable. You don't need to steer away from me. Not only say hi, but ask me a question or let's engage in some kind of a dialogue. And I really like talking to him about his sons and how they have kind of taken on that load at the two Big Bob Gibson restaurants in Alabama there in Decatur. And they're putting in the work, as he said. They're learning the processes. 
The other thing that I thought was really interesting is the fact that while they are learning the process, that the expectation certainly is that they will learn the history, they'll learn the current process of how they're doing it, but they're also given flexibility and input and ability to evolve within the industry by implementing their own strategies and thought processes into the business. And I think maybe more than any other restaurant, a barbecue restaurant that it has been as steeped in tradition as Big Bob Gibson's has, uh, Chris said it here on the interview yesterday, that if you were from northern Alabama, everybody in northern Alabama knows Big Bob Gibson's restaurant. So if you have that kind of a pedigree and that kind of a history behind you, that as the older, more experienced pitmasters are teaching the new up-and-coming pitmasters that will eventually supersede them, you might not want them deciding to make twists and turns into the recipes and the processes and the strategies that have worked so well for decades and decades and decades prior to you. But Chris said, hey, not only do I expect it, I'm encouraging them to make their own choices. So that was a really great interview that I had with Chris Lilly. We obviously talked a little bit of competition as well. So go back and get that. You can subscribe via podcast. And then closing it out in the third hour was Linda Orson, or as she is known by many here in the barbecue and grilling industry, Mama Shed. And I told her that I had spoken to a number of piece, uh, people just like I had uh, talked with Jeff Pryles about in the first hour of this show about coming down here and getting feedback. And last year was the first time I had attended any type of barbecue or grilling conference that uh, related to it. It was the HPB Expo that was held in Atlanta, Georgia last year. It was in Nashville last week, I believe. But I didn't get to go to that one because we had a sports conflict. And that was a good event, but there was a lot of other cursory and ancillary categories, for the lack of a better descriptor, that were also in there. Fireplaces, uh, things that had to do with home heating, things that had nothing to do with barbecue and grilling. And then you had a barbecue and grilling section of the exhibitor's hallway that was there. And that portion was great. I got to lead a, uh, meet a lot of manufacturers and make some really good contacts. But this is all barbecue and grilling related. You're not seeing home heating stoves. You're not seeing the guy from Slap Chop pitching his product or the really super absorbent swimmer towels that are always at every single trade show. The people that are here are barbecue and grilling related, and there's not a huge amount of exhibitors here. B&B Charcoal is in the corner off to the side. Then you have Flame Boss. Sucklebuster Seasonings is here. Traeger. Chops Power Injector is here. So, uh, But, I mean, I think if there's 20 total exhibitors here, that might be stretching it a little bit. But it's all barbecue and grilling related. So from that aspect to get down here, uh, you're in front of uh, everybody that has a vested interest in the live fire cooking and grilling. So that's pretty neat. But I told her... Here, I'm talking with people. What do you think about the NBBQA? Tell me about it. I'm thinking I'm going to go down, blah, blah, blah. And as I had told her, there weren't really great reviews and comments by some of the people. You know, not total S show comments, but they weren't overly glowing, at least a portion of them. And I was telling her this and... I feel it was kind of incumbent upon me to, to make sure she knew the background and the info that I had. And pretty much everyone said that, you know, it, here's what we think about it now, but prior to Linda Orison taking over, uh, well, not taking over, and as she said, she was maybe misunderstood what the ask for president was, like she was going to go on and people were going to have to vote for her, but there, she ran unopposed that year and got on the ballot, perhaps by accident. But whatever the case, she decided to grab hold of the wheel and start moving the NBBQA ship in the right direction. And as I was talking with uh, President-elect Heath Hall from Pork Barrel Barbecue, 
she was the first person that she meant or that he mentioned in regards to kind of correcting the NBBQA ship. And this is an organization that has been around, I believe Linda said for 26 years prior. So within that last four years, Mark Lambert, the current president finishing out his second term here this year, and then Heath Hall will take over next year in 2019. She got the ball rolling. Mark has picked it up and continued to move it in that direction. And now we have to see how it's going to continue to gain momentum. What kind of a membership growth is there going to be? That is going to be key to keep this thing going. Along with any organization, if you don't have paying members, you have nothing but disaster that is going to be waiting eventually. That might be a short, quick death. That could be a very long death. I mean, who knows? But you need to have a membership in order to maintain enthusiasm and interest and all this other stuff. And that has to be or that is a main focus of incoming President Heath Hall's vision as he serves his two-year term. And then it's the question I've been asking everybody. Is it really geared more towards the trades, the people in the industry, the restaurant owner, the guy selling a rubber sauce? Or are they trying to open it up for the whole conference? Because remember, this started with a reception on Wednesday, and then it was a full day Thursday, a full day Friday. It's a full day today. Everybody's going to be packing up and leaving either in the evening tonight or catching flights and driving out tomorrow on Sunday. So it's a a good three and a half, maybe four-day event. Are they trying to figure out if having a portion or, or opening it up to a general consumer, a person like me. Now, I, I guess I can be considered media portion of it, but holding that aside, I liked barbecue before I started doing a podcast, before I started doing a live show. Can I see myself coming to something like this and having access for three days in a row to a famous Dave, to a Chris Lilly, to other experts in the industry, And I'm not necessarily looking to start up a business or get a rub to market or open up a barbecue restaurant or anything like that, but just have a chance to be around and mark out to some of these great names in the industry that I've seen on television. Is that a vision that they're trying to to move into or is that an interest that they're trying to do and maybe mix the two and open up a more vast potential of members to the NBBQA? And maybe that's where the gray area is coming in here. I I think I'm asking everybody as they're on the microphone about MBBQA, and nobody seems to have any problem telling me what a great conference it is and how great of a time they're having, and all these great people are here, and they're very accessible, and I get all that. But it, it might be helpful to be just a bit critical to a certain degree to say, is this where you want to keep it, or do you want to open it up to have a bigger membership potential? And is it, and let's answer the questions or let's ask and answer the questions of, is that have a potential of diluting what you're trying to do by letting in General Jane and John? Or do you want to take that membership money because it could be an easy cash grab and infuse a revenue? I don't know. But it's probably worth having the discussion. By the way, it looks like uh, DBQ a no-show. How do I know this? I've been filling 30 minutes by running my mouth with great takes. That's why. So, actually, are the dudes from Gorilla right out there? We can grab them. I'll do a quick break, and then we'll set them up. So, that's what's happened yesterday. Of course, there was the State Cook-Off Association. If you follow me on Facebook, I went live right around the time that uh, Poncho and Lefty were going to be putting their stakes on. And, you know, all Facebook, well, I mean, this is Facebook Live too, of course, but uh, I I don't usually go Facebook Live from my phone because I had said in my uh, podcast master class that I did on (laughs) Thursday morning, Just because Facebook Live has a live button doesn't mean that everybody should go live at any point. If you're not going to be able to bring a value add or you don't have a thought, you're just going to start mumbling and talking into a microphone and sound like an ass. That's probably not bringing value to anybody and people are going to jump in and they're going to jump out and you're going to wonder why three people watch it because it sucked. 
So I want to pick my spots, and I had the opportunity and occasion to be with Poncho and Lefty yesterday as they were doing their stake, and we had a great run of audience, and it's been viewed since then almost 5,000 times. And they were really great in the fact that they, in the middle of the steak cook, I'm asking them questions as they're coming in from the feed and they had no problem stepping away and answering in depth and giving out their whole process. I mean, it's cooking a steak, so I don't think there's anything secret there, but they were doing some methods and they had weights and they had strings tied around steaks and some of this other stuff that people were asking me about. So they answered and I was able to pass that along and it was Quite a, quite a good time. So I appreciate them allowing me the opportunity to do that. Now, for their genuine efforts, I think I caused them to earn like mid-pack results. So I apologize to the guys from PL. And I'm sure I'm not invited to also stream the steak cook today, but that's all right. Um, I'm speculating. Maybe they like me still, but I'd be kind of pissed at me if I caused me to be halfway through the pack because they're really good steak cooks. All right, uh, we are going to load up uh, Shane Draper and Mark Graham from Gorilla here, so stick with me for just a few moments. I'm going to get them mic'd up, and then we will be right back. We're broadcasting live from the National Barbecue and Grilling Association's 2018 IM Barbecue Conference. Stick around. We'll be right back. as promised uh, this segment because I believe I ran the contest on mute the first time we will be giving away a copy of Jess Pryle's new book again I don't know if she will be signing it or if I can convince her into doing that Uh, however if I can convince her into giving me a copy of the book I will offer what I've always offered with any book I always get I will sign my autograph in somebody else's book Awesome. <laughs> Jamie Proviance started that trend. He sent me a copy of his book. I signed it, sent it back to him. And then I said, hey, I have these stack of books that I've read through, and I keep the ones I like. <laughs> and I say, okay, here, you can win this book. I will sign a copy with my autograph and somebody else's book. And that's, that's a legit. thing. That's, that's a thing. We need to sweeten the deal, Greg. We need to throw some stuff in on that, man. <laughs> so you guys did? Yeah, let's All do right. it, man. You tell me. Uh, see, it's Jess's book, right? Jess's book. Uh, they they got to use our beef rub then just to, uh, you know, bother Jess. It'd All be right. Great. Yeah, we'll throw in a group of sauces and rubs, man. Sauces and rubs from Gorilla as well. So all you have to do is be the first one in with an email. And in the subject line, Hardcore Gorilla. That's yes. all you have to do. Hardcore Gorilla. Be the first one in. You get the copy of Jess's book, and you get a bundle of rubs and sauces from the guys at Gorilla, uh, Shane and Mark. You can see them right there on the video, and we will go ahead and pull them up here. Again, in the subject line of an email, be the first one, Hardcore Gorilla. Continuing to produce incredibly mediocre content in an exceptionally professional way. You're listening and watching the Barbecue Central Show. Once again, here's your host, Greg Rampey. All right, welcome back. Broadcasting live from the National Barbecue and Grilling Association, I am BBQ 2018, Fort Worth, Texas. And rolling into the third and final hour of the 
third full and final day will be drawing to a close here at some point this evening. Thanks again to me for doing Danielle's segment. <laughs> <laughs> who just showed up three minutes before the top of the hour saying, Check your phone, motherfucker! You know what? Get out of here. <laughs> can't, I can't take that. I ruined my voice, but, you know, it's my fault to a certain degree. You know, you got to tell these people that even though the doors close, you, it's all right. You can come in. It's all right. Uh, winning the book and, row, and the rough, Doug Durda. All right, Doug. I believe his Twitter handle is Yins Love Barbecue. He's a Pittsburgh Pennsylvania guy, so I, uh, I'm a Pittsburgh Steelers fan, all about it. Oh, great! That's uh, kismet then. So, uh, Doug, you're going to get a book, and you're going to get some really good rubs and sauces. Award winning, actually, uh, officially right? award winning. That's right, officially uh, uh, awards of excellence, award winning rubs. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I am being joined right now by Mark Graham. Uh, okay, let's try it again. By Mark Graham and Shane Draper, Gorilla Grills. Thanks for having Gents. us. Thanks for uh, coming in here and hanging out with me for the uh, last hour, for a few minutes here. Um, so the pellet grill market continues to explode. Um, Traeger originally was that driver, and um, they sold, and then Traeger got really weird, and then they resold, and Traeger kind of came back into to prominence again. But within that time span, there were all of a sudden a pellet proliferation of manufacturers. And uh, from an industry standpoint, hey, that's a really good thing. It's not just one name anymore. And now you have the ability to come out and present your product to the market and start to do ways of differentiation and mm -hmm. enter different kinds of levels and stuff. So, uh, Mark, let me start with you. Uh, you're kind of the brains behind this whole operation. Um, the company that you were with also did home heating, uh, pellet home heating, and were you approached to do something into the barbecue market at that point? Or were you a fan of pellet cookers and say, hey, we're doing this over here. Let me tinker around and see what I can bring to market. Yeah, pretty much the latter. Um, I was going to the HBPA shows and with our pellet furnace, and we did those for three, four years. We actually still make them. But uh, while I was at these shows, I seen a few of these um, pellet smokers. I'm like, man, that's pretty cool. And I love cool and innovative things. And the technology we already had, essentially, the, the pellet furnace is the same concept. Um, our furnace is way more complicated, quite frankly. Um, but the, the the art of burning pellets, not a big deal. We already had that sheet metal work. Hey, that's what we do. We have millions of dollars of laser centers. So it was basically me going to my best friend who owns the business. And like, hey, uh, I know it's not my job, but can I work on one of these on the side? He goes, yeah, just like after hour stuff. So I'd start dinking around with it on the side and uh, we came up, you know, our team came up with some great concepts and some, we wanted to be different. So the Gorilla, our Pro Smoke series is, um, it's a different look. It has a, a can, um, clamshell style door. It's got a different body look to it. Um, just really different. And that was key for us. We didn't want to be just another uh, barrel smoker to come out into the market with. And uh, so once we came out of that, hit it the market and people loved the look and it was different. And so that's how I got into it. So it wasn't new. It wasn't just, just trying to find a grill and like, oh, let's put our name on it. And it was something we already knew and how to basically build. So the fun was making it different. So, I mean, you kind of gloss over a lot of cool stuff about the genesis of the project. So how long does it take you to go from, hey, I'm going to tinker around with this to saying, hey, this really might have legs and I'm making it in a unique look and then bringing it to market. Well, the first time we took it to the HPBA show, it was just more of a, okay, is this going to take, is people going to like it? And we set it in a new product uh, section and it was amazing how many people walked up right to that grill because it looked so different. It was so unique. And then when we were outside in our booth, we also had people walking up and they just stop and like, what is that thing? And then I kind of show them how the lid opens. I'm like, oh, that's a pellet smoker. And they're using words like, that's cool. That's innovative. This is unique. All the stuff that we wanted. That's number one in marketing. you got to get people's attention. If it looks just like the one right next to it, how do you differentiate yourself? And so at that point, we knew we had a design um, and we had customer interest in it. So then it's just how to get it to market. And man, is that the hard part. Shane, I remember talking to you, Shane Draper, by the way, from Draper's Barbecue. Originally, is there a Draper's Barbecue anymore, or is that uh, yeah, a sure, defunct sure. situation? No, it's, uh, we, we still have our rubs and sauces. Uh, my dad pretty much runs it. Um, I found out while I like 
making rubs and sauces. I don't necessarily like selling rubs and sauces, which sounds kind of crazy. Um, I just love the creation of, of sauces and rubs. That's kind of what put Mark and I back together again. But, um, yeah, it's uh, still a Draper, so we're, we're still doing the thing. When you were contacted by Mark, or uh, I'm not sure exactly where the, the uh, transaction took place, but uh, what was your experience prior to getting in touch with Mark about the Gorilla um, testing and R&D right. uh, prior to that? Yeah, so you and I actually probably received our test unit, the original, the OG, <laughs> uh, about, what, seven years ago, five yeah. years ago, roughly? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I did. I had a show similar to yours, uh, not nearly as cool because I don't have the voice, right? Um, uh, or well, the hopefully the content is what's saying <laughs> right. about oh, the yeah. voice. <laughs> if the voices are cool, a lot of people have really good right. shows. Right. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I, I, I hit up Mark, and I was like, dude, I want to review one of the units. I think it looks amazing. I can tell by looking at it, it's going to cook great because just just the shape of it. Um, and I totally uh, whamboozled him into sending me one. Uh, I cooked on it one time, fell absolutely in love, and just told him, "If there's anything you need, you let me know. I'm I'm in on this. You know, I I, I think you have something really, really game changing. The only thing that hurt the product at that time is just the cost. You know, yeah. it was just very expensive. And uh, you, you still cook on yours, man. What what do you yeah, think of it? Absolutely. I mean, it's been aside from you know what now are very recent items. That really don't necessarily affect how it is cooking. It's a you know the the fuel stuff that we've been talking about. I don't mm. want to get into the weeds um, with the with the guys here, but you know from a life pan, uh, lifespan perspective, uh, my thing has always been if uh, you contact me about sending me a grill, here's what you need to know up front. I live in Cleveland, Ohio. The weather sucks nine months out of the year, and the other three months it's really effing hot and humid. <laughs> and these are going to go on my deck or my patio. Right. And if you don't supply a cover i'm going to cover it and i'll uncover it when i use it and i'll cover it back up when i'm not using it but it's going to sit out in the rain in the wind and in the wind and rain in the wind rain and snow and the ice and all that stuff and it will collect on top of it but (laughs) to me that is real life absolutely Uh, absolutely. you can give it to somebody and say hey stick it in your garage and make sure it's in a lean to and all this other stuff but um you know, the word transparency is, is thrown a- around a lot. I just want to be real. Like if somebody's yeah. going to say, I want to send you this, then I want to say, this is the environment it's going to be. And right. so know that up front, because if it's a piece of shit and it's not going to be able to stand up to that, you need to know that in right. a year or two, I'm going to say, I cook uh-huh. on it. Here's what it is. But now it's falling apart because it couldn't stand up to the elements right. or wasn't built robust enough. So, uh, you know, from and it still looks good. I mean, there's yeah. a little bit of rust on, some, but it was powder coated back then. Yeah. It was yeah. it was a whole different monster. Oh yeah, I mean, the improvements we made are because of people like yourself. And when you test in the labs and we design it in all, you know in our facilities and we got the in, inside labs, that's completely different from the guy in Oregon to the guy in Florida to the guy in Arizona. So even as we develop stuff. I find customers that, you know, I have quite a bit of information with and contact with them. Like, hey, I'm working on something new. Are you interested in let me try it out? Because I got to find those different environments, altitude, heat, moisture. If you just design it in Michigan where we're at and just test it and like, all right, it's good. It's not going to work, man. Shane mentioned price. You know, that that was being a hindrance right off the bat. There's the constant discussion that goes on of price point and made in america yep, yep. oh yeah bring it in from overseas and now we have like this competing interest so you were making it here yeah you were making a great product it wasn't priced competitively whatever that means yep so obviously to me when i hear that it either wasn't making the till spin enough or it wasn't meeting a certain sales metric so the good thing is it wasn't like, okay, sorry, Mark, scrap the whole thing, and we're going to go back to just doing stoves. It was like, is there another way that we can still keep quality but lower price point? And that typically means you're going to have to go overseas in order to make that happen. And that can be done a couple of different ways. You can say, okay, and you pitch it out there, and you go, okay, make it kind of like we do. Right. And it comes back, and the door doesn't maybe close all the way, and the digital whatever doesn't work half the time or whatever. Or you you have to spend the money to get over there and visit often or have boots on the ground there to make sure that you are holding them to task. Because 
maybe people don't realize or not, but overseas, they can build really good stuff. Oh, my gosh. oh yeah, they can. But if you're not there to hold them to task, right. they will start cutting corners very quickly because it's like human nature. So how have you been able to, to do that as a, as a success? No, I'm glad you actually brought that up because, yes, one of the things we want to do is make an American-made grill. We had who flight. doesn't? By I the way, we, had, <laughs> yeah. we want to come out where a 47 year old family owned business, stamping, welding steel. So like, oh, this is going to be easy, and the dealers are like, oh man, this is going to be great. I can't wait to have an American made grill on on the floor. So we did all the promotion for it. Like, this is going to be great. And uh, three years later, with really slumping sales, very limited sales, I kept contacting the dealers, and it was the same story with everyone. The first part that was cool is most of the dealers actually took it home and used it more than any other grill they had. Right. So then they're like, this thing is awesome. So I knew the per- uh, performance was there. But the next thing out of their mouth was, well, people walked up to it. They gravitated towards it. The look is awesome. Like, oh, this door is sweet. This is beautiful. How much is it? Oh, at, that, at, the point, at that time, it was 1500 bucks. Yeah, yeah. What'd they do? Oh, okay. They turn and go right next to the imports. Right. So we knew we had a, prod- a good project. We knew we had um, the performance was there, just not the price. So he's like... In our current business, we already dealt with overseas, and we've been through all those trial, trials and tribulations with overseas. So we already kind of knew how to work the system over there and be effective. So it's like, all right, first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna be, I'm gonna own up to it. Got the film crew in. Let's do a, a, a face, um, a YouTube video, and just own up to it. Hey, we tried, guys. We really, really tried, but the consumers didn't react. It wasn't there. So I went overseas, and uh, I spent boots on the ground, as you said. And one of the great stories that I, I, I like to tell is. You know, and I was over there constantly with the engineers. When we get product in, we'd reviewed it. Every girl to this date is still opened up, fully inspected by our guys, put back in the box because we want to make sure when it leaves. But as I was going back and forth over there, I was sitting at the table one time with and uh, with all the other engineers, and some of them spoke English, some of them didn't. And our translator was there with me, <clears throat> with me, and they're all kind of laughing and stuff. I'm like, man, what? Because I had my whole list of hit points, right? Yeah. And I, I talked to my lady. I said, are they laughing at me? Or are they getting it? I thought they were getting pissed at me because I wanted, hey, I don't like to screw it sticks out. You know, it's something for the cover to catch on. All these little nitpicky things. And I was a little OCD. I still am. And she goes, Mark, they are loving this. I was like, what? She goes, they are not used or, or they're not used to this. They're used to the American company coming over there and say, cheapen it up, cheapen it up. You got to make it for this. Right. right. She goes, they're engineers. They love building good stuff. But that's not what the Americans go over there for. They go over there to get the cheapest thing. If you don't make it cheaper, I'm going to go to the next company. Right. So for me to come in there and they're like, well, that's going to cost another dollar twenty three to thicken the steel up. Yeah. So <laughs> right. right. So the grill we got in, I'm almost embarrassed to say it was better than what we make. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, but but you have to be on you, to your point. You got to have your feet over there and in their business all the time. Because if you walk away for a month or two. Uh, is a little spiral out of control. Shane, let's talk a little bit about when the transition happens and you start bringing them back from overseas. Uh, as Mark said, it's a great grill. It's made well, um, maybe better than what was happening in, in Michigan. But do you have to make it a point to go to the consumer base and say, hey, it, you know, it used to be made here, but now we're doing this. Do you try and be as transparent as possible in that regard? Or are you just know that it could it could be left as an unsaid why did the price drop i don't know it looks good i'm now i'm going to be a buyer at you know 7.99 instead of 1500 you know, we've been unapologetic about it from the beginning and, and owned it and and i think that's the difference with us you know uh like to to mark's point we we led with a video hey guys we tried and you know you probably had the same conversation with mark that i did at the 1500 dollar price point i love this damn thing but I can't recommend it to anyone. Right. Coming here to MBBQA, the number one comment we get from guys like Malcolm, uh, Mike uh, with with Cold Three, those guys when they open up the pamphlet and go, "Are you shitting me? This thing is <laughs> delivered for seven hundred dollars. Yeah. This is a product I can get behind because it's built well, and I don't have to feel bad about recommending it to the backyard guy, right. to my buddy, to my wife's friend, whatever." And that's what I love as, as someone that I have to put my name behind something no longer is it, Oh, it's so good, but yeah, you're going to take a beating at the kitchen table, <laughs> you know, getting this by the wife. Yeah, right. yeah. So now the price points, right. Um, we know our, our tagline has been putting money where it matters. Our first meeting together when Mark's like, Hey, we're, we got a surprise for you. Come on up. We want you to see a few things. 
the first thing we do did we broke out a notepad and we had three pages of notes. I was like, if you if we make these changes and we can stay at these price points, I think you've got something. And still to this day, we did it here in the the session the other day. Mm-hmm. Anytime the notepad comes out and we start drawing on it, a new product comes out. You yeah. know, and that's what I love about what we do together because it's the cook's perspective, and I'm going to beat the crap out of it on the competition trail with the engineer's perspective of this is how I'm going to build it right. And I think that hybrid has made Gorilla what it really is right now. It's been essential for sure. Yeah. When that Gorilla, the the flagship product as I call it, uh, kind of proves itself out, it's unique in look, it's got a, some pretty cool features and benefits. The thing that I continue to, to rave about to people is the fact that, you know, the cooking grate is so solid and it yeah. looks aside for some, you know, burn on grease here and there, it looks like I might have just replaced it a couple of weeks ago, and meanwhile, it's going on eight years old. We have never ever replaced a cooking grate. Yeah, I mean, it is, so that attention to detail is something you know where you, as a consumer, you can kind of buy into that, and, and you recognize the value, and you don't have any problem spending the money on that. And let's be clear on that point because yeah. that one cooking grate, if we went to kind of the standard, I'll call it Lowe's quality, yeah, we could pocket you know seven bucks off that, but we don't. We want that in the grill so it lasts a lifetime for the consumer. We would rather them – we take all that money that we we don't have to share by having a distribution network and just put it back in the grill. When does additional products start to pop up? I mean, is that pretty much as you're putting that first one together, you're like, well, if this works out, I'm, you know, you're already spitballing stuff up here to, to grab down, or do you does this one need to prove out first – and then you're going to be hearing from the, those customers, well, man, I love this, but it would be really nice if we oh, had yeah. this oh, or yeah. that. Oh, yeah. well, that's, it's always fun to our social media. we got a pretty large uh, following on Facebook, uh, owner's group. Uh, it's my Gorilla, Grill Smoker, over 8,000 members in there. And they're always beating Shane and I up. Hey, I'd really like you guys come out with this. Hey, I'd like you come out with this. And our theory has been and still is we want to make sure the ones that are out there are dialed in. they got to be right. I'm not going to just try to race to get new product to the market just because people ask because then you lose sight of your core product. And for us, it was make sure, are these good? All right. Can they be improved on? All right, let's get this taken care of. Now that being said in the off time, you know, I got other engineers I work with and we're always playing with new unique ideas and we seriously really listen to our, our um, customers. And I think in one of the seminars is listen to your customers. They're the ones out there. What, what they want is what you want to sell. So you got to find out what they want. What, right. what's, uh, what's interesting to them. So we, we actually did a poll, and there was like, hey, what would you like Gorilla Girls to do? And it was so informative for us to see what the public wants. And uh, so we're always working on new stuff, but we, we're not going to – until the other ones are dialed in, we're not going to race to get to the market with how many products we can – how many SKUs we can have. Right. right. We see large companies almost use the first 60 to 90 days of their sales as their test market as far as proofing whether the software works, whether the, the instructions work, all that stuff. We don't do that. It's got to be ready to go right out of the box. We'd rather be slower to market, but right, as opposed to sending it out there. And, you know, if we had Wi-Fi, you know, it's like, oh, the Wi-Fi is not quite right. We'll run some updates over the next 60 days to dial it in. That's not who we are. There's the beauty in KISS. Keep it simple, stupid. As no. 11 years in the military, and that's kind of always ran by. And we're – it's barbecue, man. I, these things are really getting pretty complicated machines. I mean, there's a lot of technology into these things already. So I just want to fight that a little bit. I want these people that have the ease of the push button, set your temperature and walk away. Um, I love technology. Don't get me wrong, but I like it in lasers. I like it in stuff to build stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and your barbecue, man, I'm just, I really struggle with the fact of putting too much into it and driving that price point where the average consumer that may not be able to afford a, a thousand dollar grill, but you know, I really want to get into smoking. I want to have that grill that's well built. It's easy to use. And that price point is there for them to Shane's point earlier. And that's the key for us, I think. So you have that flagship, unique looking product. When do you bring in Silverback? When do you bring in Kong as additional options? Well, the Silverback was uh, probably about six to eight months later. And that obviously has taken over. I mean, it dominates the sales Hmm. because it's kind of heartbreaking for me, quite frankly, because the the gorilla is my baby, but your first child, I know, I know. And I feel like my first child. Yes. First child. (laughs) I thought you love them equally, but separately. (laughs) Right. I know. Right. But what I didn't realize is that it looking different was a problem. People didn't get it. It doesn't look like a smoker. It didn't have the smokestack sticking off the side. It wasn't a barrel shaped. 
and people just didn't get it. And the pitchers, since we don't have dealerships and uh, a dis- distribution network, people couldn't go up there and look at it and feel it. Uh, so we, the Silverback really, really launched us. But now what we're finding is now that the girls are starting to get out there more and we open a brand new showroom in Holland, people are coming in, buying the Silverback, and they're like, that's the gorilla? I'm like, yeah. They're like, that's way bigger than I thought it yeah. was. And they end up leaving with a gorilla. So the, the OG, as they deemed it now, is making a huge comeback. Because even here, everybody oh, yeah. that we talk to, yeah. all the comp- competitor guys, are like, that thing's unique. It's different. Well, yeah. People that understand airflow and thermodynamics a little bit as a pit master immediately look at the OG and go, that shape, that that that's going to crush it in competition. It's like, yeah, it, we're, it really will. That, that slightly leaned in dome lid really you know circulates that smoke around it and it it, it candy weaver said it best i mean miss freaking pellets yeah, herself. Miss pellets yeah on the stage at world food the gorilla is the best pellet smoker i've ever cooked on wow. hands down and she's cooked on all of them all of and them. or made she's non-pellet cookers into pellet cook. she right. made a jambo pit into a pellet cooker right yeah she and has five gorillas yeah five of them. Five? five yes <laughs> Yeah. Wow. yeah, she got a family of gorillas. Yes, <laughs> she gave one to her. Her original one that we um, she purchased because we couldn't give her any grills. She doesn't play that, and she gave it to her uh, her her son and daughter in law for their wedding gift. And she goes, I want to I want to buy another one for myself. I'm like, uh, okay. And then she gave that one to a family member, bought another one. I was yeah. like, good grief. So yeah, through World that's Food a Fire and you know? I, she she won she won one. Yeah, she said, you gotta be kidding me, another one right on stage. <laughs> it was it was hilarious. But for me. As, as a representative of the company, it was such a huge testament to have someone in her statue oh, yeah. that's in this industry to say this thing is awesome. Because I was like, ah, oh, just we bent some steel and it's a good grill. Yeah. But that was a real that was really cool to hear. So you have the cookers on this side of the equation, and then rubs and sauces on the other side. Obviously, Shane, um, certainly that's a, a strength of yours. Sure. How much of what is in the current product line of seasonings and sauces was? either fully or partly a Shane Draper rubber sauce? Every bit of it. Every ounce of it. The year that I delayed the beef rub because it just wasn't quite to my standards, that, that's all me. Yeah. Um, it's, it, so I would say what, what I'm doing with Gorilla now is what I should have done with Draper since the beginning. Like if I, I spent 10 years learning what I should have done, right? Uh, and our, I still love our smoking sauce. It's a great product. still love our AP rub. Uh, but... Everything that goes into Gorilla, I feel like I'm doing literally my best work I've ever done right now because I don't have, I'm not waiting. Like if I don't release this right now, we're not going to make sales and I'm not going to be able to pay people. Yeah. I don't have that pressure. Um, and I also, these guys are thankfully cool enough to be like, no, you do it when it's right, even though they, they get frustrated. You know, it's like, seriously, another couple of months? I'm like, <laughs> it's not right, bro. I'm not, yeah. it's like, I'm got, if it's got my name on it, it's, it's got to just crush it. And that, that's what this was, you know, coming here. It's like, let's put it in. I think it's going to win. I think we'll we'll do great with all the products. And we have our mustard sauce is – I never wanted to do one. But when I was forced to kind of write that song, right, and I was like, well, you know what? I kind of like that that genre now. Uh, and it's, it's one of the best things I've ever done. I mean, I, I love what I'm doing with Gorilla right now because it's a perfect fit for me to kind of cut loose, not be Shane Draper – but be the pit master for Gorilla Grills, have a little different, you know, point of view, maybe be a little um, off kilter of what I normally would do, Mm -hmm. be a little aggressive. Um, And it's, it's just that relationship has worked out where it allows me to absolutely do the best that I've ever done in in barbecue with sauces and rubs. Is there a flavor of rub and a flavor of sauce that you can point out to as the consumers picking as their favorite? That mustard sauce is killing it right yeah. now, our golden bowl. But the Congo kick, um, they're, they're all doing great, though. I know. Thick and bold. It, the, our, our AP rub. AP rub is. The beef rub. I mean, the only complaint we have across the product line is, would you please put this in the gallon or the yeah. five-pound bag? Because this is just ridiculous. Yeah, that's the number one. What people don't always realize is that that means i got to order another 8,000 <laughs> bottles. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, $10,000. The, company po- the, yeah. the co-packers have their minimums. Oh, right? my gosh. Sure, it, yeah. it, it's brutal. I got a, We got a big old room full of it right now. And I'm like, okay, now we got to do that again. Right. Just the minimum orders are ginormous. Yeah. Well, and that all goes back to, so I, I know what Mark has done with the gorilla, right? And how just the attention to details there, he will not cut any corners ever. I had to bring it to the sauce game. Like I fought to get into certain labs and certain companies because I knew they're the best in the world. 
and I did not want our product produced by anyone else, even though it made it more expensive. The other comment we'll get sometimes is like, oh, man, $7.99 for a bottle of sauce. And you and I know for competition-level sauce, it's not that expensive. Yeah. But to the average consumer who's used to the, the, <laughs> the, the long line at Walmart where yeah. nothing should be above $2.99, mm-hmm. it is a little more pricey, but it's made with the best ingredients. I will not let the, the co-packer, they will not deviate from the list of ingredients that I've given them. We've nailed them down on it. The way it's produced, we've nailed them down on it. And like I said, I got to control every piece of this, with the exception of the actual name of the product. <laughs> yeah. I don't do good with naming. The marketing guys are so much better. Yes, than they are. <laughs> but I got to control that from start to finish for the first time, and it was really cool to do. What is your take on MBBQA? Uh, I think you guys both said that this was uh, both of your first times down, so... Um, we've kind of had this running dialogue on the live shows of as I was getting ready to come down, I was reaching out to a number of people. Uh, they were other grill manufacturers. They were people in the business. They were just, you know, uh, personalities, I guess, if you will, and saying, Hey, you know, what do you think? And there was, I wanted to say an overwhelming majority, but there seemed to be a trend of people saying, "Eh." um, so, but I don't. I wanted to get down here and see, see um, you know, was, they were nice enough to put together like a podcast house here. They had me and a couple other shows and they were seeing a value and having whatever form of digital media people want to classify us as here, which a lot of other places probably wouldn't have seen that value or, or just said, well, if you want to come down, figure it out yeah, show up. Luck. We're not going to give you any direction or what just, you know, range free. So that was very nice, very appreciated. And I guess the, the, the question that I'm long winding is, is it really a industry conference and organization to where you have to be a grill manufacturer or you have to be a sauce guy or you have to own a restaurant? Or is there a way that you can include a fan like me for the whole three-day conference instead of just, you know, it seems like more fans out here today. It, can you figure out a way where you could string both sides together and then have an increase in membership because I think that's where the biggest detractor is if you ask anybody and they're honest here is that there's like 600 members right. or something like that. I mean, the Pit Club Forum on AmazingRibs.com has 16,000 members. Right. So something isn't jiving or there's some kind of miss going on, and I'm just wondering what your take is. Well, I get, yes, this is our first time here, and honestly, we're kind of half against it because it's a lot of money to come down here for Shane and I to fly down here and and the amount of money. And it's always about your return on investment. But um, for us, it was like Brad Barrett, man. He's like, you guys got to go. I mean, if you're in the industry, this is a place where if nothing else, go check it out. And you got, it's not always the content. It's the people that you meet. Yeah. And that's what I've realized from a business standpoint. And Shane's great. He knows this industry he knows people. So some of the seminars, a lot of stuff we kind of knew, but you know, it was still all great stuff and I get completely why they do it. And I think it's a great idea, but it was more valuable to us is the people that we meet. And that's, that's what matters. I think for us right now. So did you make any contacts here over the last couple of days that say, Hey, we want to, well, that was the other thing I was, I was going to talk about is you don't have a, um, you don't go into the mom and pop thing nope. or you don't sell on Amazon or anything nope. like that. Correct. Nope. Yeah. So, I mean, so, you can't make a contact that says, oh, hey, Mark, you know, we see this thing. We, we buy into it. We want to start stocking. Nothing nope. like that. Yep. So, I mean, I think the benefit for us, and, and I, it's probably more benefit to me, right? I mean, let's be honest, because I know all the personalities here. Yeah. You and I have known each other for seven years. Probably longer better. than that. Yeah. Um, so it's getting to see those guys a little bit like a family reunion. But the value to the raw new guy would definitely be those sessions right i Mm -hmm. I think there's some great stuff there um what i love seeing though is the guys that i started with uh, the mike uh, radesco you know uh, code three guys are now kind of the ogs right right right. i i kind of see this shift happening and and listen i am please no one take this as me saying (laughs) mike mills get off the stage you know nothing like that man but what we're seeing is those seeds that were planted seven years ago are now the guys that have, you know, they've been, they've been grinding and they've earned a place kind of at the table, if you will. And I love seeing the Mike Mills and, you know, the famous Daves and the shed guys all saying that guy, that guy needs to be here. 
that guy needs to be on stage. We want to hear his story. I love seeing that. I think more people need to know about that. Um, but to your point, man, they got to do something to get more people here. Yeah. You know, it, the biggest detriment is the first three days of this, it looked empty. Mm. Today it's full. But if I paid to be an exhibitor here, where are my people? Right. Where am I demoing to? We right. got to have that every day. So it needs to be hours for the public every day, I think. The other thing from a sauce and rub manufacturer, um, I wanted to beat the best in the world because uh, I want to be the best in the world. Yeah. The the rate, and I know there's got to be a cost. I, I get it. And I don't expect to get money back, you know, like winning a grand championship for, for sauce and rub here. Um, but the, the rate of entry keeps it, like when I started Draper's Barbecue, I couldn't afford to enter that many categories here. That's got to come down. It can't be 50 or $30 per entry and entering eight or 10 categories per sauce because I mean, our bill for that was in the hundreds. Um, and I felt bad even sending that to grow. Yeah. You know, so I would love to see 150 entries in every sauce and rub category, 150, 200 entries in every media category. And we're not going to get that until those entry fees come down a little bit and becomes a little more accessible. Shane Draper and Mark Graham from Gorilla Grill spending time here with me. Uh, gentlemen, really appreciate the time. Thanks so much for doing it. Thank you. you Our got there they are. We are live right here. NBBQA for the IMBBQ conference. We will rejoin and kind of close out the day's and week's broadcast with Kale Phelps and Texas embedded correspondent Doug Scheide. Can't be in Texas and not have your Texas embedded correspondent <laughs> be chastised. Uh, we will be right back. Stick around. Whole packers, full racks, legs and thighs, injecting butts. If you've never heard this before, you might think you found the best triple X show ever. Let's get back to the most homoerotic host out there today, Craig Rimpy. Just at heart, you know, main and started 10 years old backyard, my dad building cinder block pits him and his fishing buddy cooking hogs um they got the bug to compete and uh a few years after that uh we have always been a newspaper business so we started national barbecue news 1990 um at that time i was a fresh graduate um saw that college was not my way of learning and uh, so uh <laughs> So I started running print presses and uh, doing some of the barbecue stuff on the back end of things, like doing tests uh, for new products and all that stuff, doing a little bit of writing. And um, in 2002, um, decided to go on my own. And uh, I never forget my dad and um, Doc Gillis, the two owners, starters of the National Barbecue News, told me, said, son, now you're not going to get rich doing this. But if you go away hungry, it's your own fault. And so I'm fat and sassy now. So, <laughs> you know, I, I eat good. I try to hang around all these rib rib givers and all that. But so in a nutshell, man, that's us. I mean, we've, I've been doing this my whole life, and I can't think of nothing else better to do, better way to do it. Are there any articles or people that you've talked to that stick out over the – I mean – Unless my oh, math is man. wrong, it's, it's it's either 28 years or 178 years, so I'm not very good at math. I'll go with 28, but, I mean, is there any one or two things that stick out over that course? Oh, mercy, man. Um, you know, probably the OBR thing we did um, in October. Um, we did an October issue, but, um, you know, we were fortunate enough to go down and did, donate a trailer to those guys um, right there and work for a week with them during the deployment down there in September. Um, matter of fact, won an award here, Award of Excellence for that article. So, you know, those things, um, they probably mean more because you saw the effect barbecue had on people other than just us, barbecue fans. Um, but, golly, man, there's a there's an awful lot of good times in that thing. You know, all the Memphis and Mays, all the American Rules, um, um but yeah, OBRs, any of their stories are to heart without a doubt. Where does the best of the best 
stand in that rank. I mean, that was oh. really one of the um, back when I had first gotten into the barbecue and started podcasting. It was American Royal and the Jack Daniels. Best of the best was in that. I mean, there were a lot of top pit masters that were looking to get in there, qualify, yep. and then and win it. It was kind of one of the majors back in the day. Yeah. Um, and you know, <laughs> do you remember the that, best of the best though? Oh yeah, yeah. That thing come about, you know, as a as a way from my mom. A lot of people didn't know the real story behind it, but for our local community, we didn't have a barbecue contest or a barbecue event ever. But you know, everybody in our town of ten thousand knew what we did, so um, it was a way for us to give back to our community. And um, so we did it. We ran it for eight years there in Douglas. As a way for to bring people to back to our town and supported us for all these years to help, you know, show what we did. And then um, we moved it last two years to uh, to the Waycross deal after our town decided they didn't want to support us anymore. So it kind of, you know, it's like a kick in the face kind of sort of thing. But um, and two, my dad was uh, my dad started having dialysis and started going downhill a little bit. So. Um, people don't realize what goes into uh, doing one of those major events. It's a year-long process in addition to already doing a monthly publication, in addition to running a weekly shopping guide in St. Mary's, Georgia. Yeah. So uh, um, it, was just a, uh, it was just a hard time because Dad was going down, so we just decided to put it on hold to give our time, uh, change our focus to him versus uh, that event. But. Are you surprised that uh, with the proliferation of technology and the internet and access to anything everywhere that uh, National Barbecue News is still as relevant as it is? You know, I, I don't I don't know how relevant it is, man. I mean, I, I have a ball going around and uh, writing and uh, having folks write about what they see in, in the barbecue world. So I don't know how relevant that is. But um, we're honored to have those folks contribute and do it. Um, as far as the print thing, I can tell you, I've spent the last two years, um, learning a lot about websites, learning a lot about SEO and trying to do things different and it's paid off. You know, a lot of our newer readers are digital subscribers, um, to the digital issue, which is a little different than the actual print issue. The content's about the same. It's just the different format delivery. Um, and that's been a savior, you know. I, I and I sit here and I'll tell you, I'll be honest. If we were just totally print, I don't think we would. The for, the former National Barbecue News. <laughs> well, we'd be doing something different. We'd yeah. be washing dishes probably at a barbecue joint somewhere to to make ends meet. But, um, but yeah, I mean, the content's what drives, it. and you know that, man. I mean, yeah, right. you've seen the shows that you've done. It's had the the right people, the right content, just soar. So. Um, same way with us. We we know those um we can measure it better through the digital side than we can the the uh print side. But yeah, we it's changing, but we're changing with it. Um uh, it's just hard for this old dog to learn those new tricks for sure. Mm, no doubt. <laughs> right. Uh Doug Shiding also joining me here, the official Texas correspondent of the Barbecue Central show, uh with Team Traeger here today, which is uh, a sponsor or an exhibitor here at MBBQA. Um have you ever been to MBBQA before, Doug? No, I haven't. Actually, I joined a couple of years ago knowing that it was going to be in Fort Worth. And last year, I couldn't make it because I had a scheduling conflict. And then this year, I was like, I'm going this year. Cool. And so when I got the call from Traeger, I was coming anyway. And then Traeger yeah. said they needed some help. And I'm like, yes, absolutely. It's a good year to be here, man. Yes. It's, so it's a good day. Give me the evaluation of you know how you see, um, as I've been – pretty open with everybody. Linda Orson, I think, was going to punch me in the face yesterday when I had asked her about it. But when I was telling people, well, I was kind of reaching out and say, you know, I've never been, you've been, or I've heard you've been, or have you ever been? And there was uh, maybe split half with people saying, hey, it's great, go. And the other half are like, I don't know. I don't know if I see a value. It's expensive, this and that. And um, I don't know if it's because maybe they weren't like in a business of barbecue and they were just fans or whatever. So um, how are you seeing, like, what's the the value plan for you? Oh, I am, um, you know, if you are starting a business, going into barbecue or something related to barbecue, I think it's an absolute necessary uh, thing to go. So, you know, like people with food trucks, you know, Hootie from Pittsburgh, and it's great for those kind of people. In fact, one of the the best presentations I went to was the the comp, uh, out of New Jersey, and they have a food oh, yeah. truck and stuff. Yep. Because I do a little bit of catering, and you know, even Jay Tenney from 
from Austin does catering and stuff. And so he and I sat there and they had some really good, you know, tips and things. And, yep. and so I went up to him after the presentation and they emailed me the presentation, et cetera. So, you know, yep. those kind kinds of things are invaluable because yeah. uh, basically I'm, I'm getting their five or six years of experience you know, to, to ramp up. It's no different yeah. than competition barbecue, right? That's right. You, you would go in and do a judge or, you know, go in and take some classes and just kind of get a, get a head start on things in addition to, you know, doing uh, things on the internet and stuff. So to me, it's been valuable, even, you know, if I wasn't part of team Traeger, uh, to come up here. In fact, you know, having, being busy on what Thursday and today, Saturday, you know, cooking meals and stuff, I've missed out on some things, uh, you know, panels and things like that. But uh, yes, I I think it's great. If you're if you want to meet anybody in the barbecue industry, this is the place to be. So is there a, an opportunity, Kale, where if you're in the business, as Doug said, if you're in the business, mm -hmm. if you're a restaurant owner, if you make a grill or you have a rubber sauce, it's, it's almost kind of a mandatory thing and you should get there. But is there a way and today there seems to be a lot of uh, guys like me and, and uh, I was going to say gals like me. I, it could be gals like me too, I guess. Um, general public type people. So they're coming out. They're getting to talk to the pit masters. They're getting to eat some food and meet some of the stars and all this stuff. But is there a way to tie in what's happening today with the rest of the week? And then you have a propensity of opening up a bigger membership base. So more members right. you get, you have an infuse of more revenues and maybe you can take it to a different place or you have the opportunity to, to grow it even bigger or have a better reach. Like what's the, the thought process exactly. there? Well, you know, and I'll be honest with you in the early, early days. Um, and this association's 27, 26 yeah. years yeah. old. So in the early, early days, it was all about education and, um, you know, there was no public day or any of that. You know, I mean, if, if you did the business of barbecue, that was who they targeted. And um, since then, it's evolved. It started as a as a public day, you know, where they would invite the public in. And um, they did it as a fundraiser, to be honest with you. Um, MEBQA has survived for so many years off of this one event. People, very few people know that, but. What is the gate uh, fee? I don't know for the general public. Is does it cost to, yeah, for the today? Public? It's a hundred bucks. Hundred bucks it's for a, the general public. It's a hundred bucks for general public wow. today. Wow! And okay. uh, so we'll see. Last year when we were down at Billy Bob's, yeah, um, we did the um, did a sampling kind of deal, and it was like forty bucks to oh, get okay. in for that. But it was like we had like all the dream teams or whatever cooking, but but the uh MEBQA survives off this event or has in the past. So now um with this new formula trying to get out of a motel, trying to get outside, have a have a venue where you can do things other than uh just like a not just the conference room feel kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. Right. And yeah. for years we did that. We went from one motel to another motel to another motel and it's like, you know, that's just not very barbecue to me. Yeah. And um you know, I, and I've been on the board for a long time and seen it. I've seen a lot of people try to pull it away and change it and met with a lot of controversy about that because that was not what it was made for. Originally, it was made for business. Yeah. And um, now technology's made it so that everybody's getting into barbecue and you, and you can do it and make it easier and do it right. You know, it's easier. Just like the Traeger, man. I mean, right. we just talked to Diva a few minutes ago. I mean – we cooked on one of the very first Traegers, the, the Pink Pig. Still got one. You just turn that thing to 200, throw your pork butt on there, and about eight hours, she's ready to roll, yep. you know? But um, not all, not everybody knows that. Yeah. But there's a huge opportunity for that. And the new the, – I say the new board. The, the newer generation of MEBQA board members uh, understand that and get it. And with Stuart leading us, I mean, he's pushing us – um, to do some expansion stuff. We just had a couple of events. They've had one in Chicago. We were down in Dooley County at the old pig jig um, where the GBA uh, event yeah. was held. So trying to do some outreach to these guys to um, do a little more for that general public guy. And uh, so today is what has evolved from a tasting last year to a more of a grilling academy today with education stuff so that they're learning to do a whole hog, how to do different stuff with the steak cook off and all that, you know, um, just showing different avenues. But at the same time, you know, for us to survive, we've got to incorporate the, the general public, the fan, the barbecue enthusiasts, 
um, because that allows us to get the Webers. That allows us to get the Traegers. It allows us to get uh, grow and grow and expand and just uh, make barbecue bigger in general and more accessible to everybody. And that's not just the business people. So. And, and I think t the venue is, here was great. Oh, so yeah. rather than just For a sure. hotel parking lot, and I mean, it has yeah. some character. It has kind yeah. of a barbecue, you know, feel. Right. And so th this has been a fantastic venue. So if you can kind of, you know, I know you're going to move it to, you know, possibly to other cities and things like right. that, Kansas City or whatever. You know, right. if you can get kind of that same kind of feel. Um, That's it. You know, and as a, as a uh, vendor with, with Traeger, we've, we've cooked twice as much food that we really needed to both, right. both days. So, That's you right. know, I mean, we could, you know, maybe if there's a program to kind of have that or give it away or firemen or, you know, to the right. public or whatever, right. you know, we, we can do that. Cool. And that's, you know, next year it will be in Kansas city and the, and the venue there is twice the size of the outside field. <laughs> um, and it is right in front of a motel though, you know? Uh -huh. So I just hope people don't get the wrong conception that oh they're going back to a motel with it no we're not we may have some classes inside but that pavilion that's about twice as big as the outside is going to be full we hope yeah maybe we're spend some deck you know some money on decorations yeah. and things make it a little home. or uh, make sure you're yeah. getting it out on social media and through digital media channels that this is where we're going to be show some videos and exactly. uh, start getting ahead of any of those questions or, or misconceptions so uh, right. people don't go eh that might be a buyer's remorse situation. Get them to say, okay, yeah, I'm going right. to uh, press over the edge and yeah. commit early, and, and we're going right. to look forward to it. So, And we hope, you know, it, the feedback will tell us where we're at on this deal because it's all brand new with the public thing. You know, the $100 price tag for me as a barbecue enthusiast just walking in the door, when I saw the program, what was happening, you know, yeah, that's kind of steep. But, you know, you, I get, agree. you get to eat, you know, um, you Three meals, you got breakfast this morning, you got lunch, and you'll probably have whole hogs. You guys been cooking all day. There's yeah. uh, the Weber guys been yeah. cooking all day. So pig wings cooking. So um, yeah, it is kind of expensive. So we'll but we'll see what the feedback is, and that's what we are going have to go by is by what the general conception is. You know, is it maybe it is too high? We'd rather have uh, numbers. Exactly. I'm not, you know, That's I'm sponsored right. by Traeger, so I'm not speaking for Traeger. Right. But we had, you know, again, we had almost 100 pounds of food, and we probably, you know, sampled 50 today. Right. And, you I know, so you. we, because we were expecting more numbers. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Right. I got you. So there we go. Live and learn. That's the biggest thing, because right. in, the, in the past, you've seen, and even with the events, we're talking about the best of the best, man. I mean, we stole from those successful events, and we made the rules up from that thing. So yeah. we learned. Um, and as that whole festival evolved, we learned what worked over here may not actually work here. Right. Yeah. So, you know, that was, that was a hair puller sometimes, but, um, once you get that puzzle put together so that we can do what you guys need done and make it successful and make those guys happy who are coming, man, it's going to be a home run. There you go. Cal Phelps, National Barbecue News, and a regional director for National Barbecue Association. And Doug Scheiding, the embedded Texas correspondent for the Barbecue Central Show, closing it out for this week's broadcast. I want to thank, very quickly, National Barbecue you, and Grilling Association for allowing us to have this media room and coming down and covering this event. It's been absolutely fabulous. And also, AmazingRibs.com, the Pitmasters Club Forum, for sponsoring my hotel room because Meathead is rich and so he couldn't be down here so I'm his mouthpiece. Piles and piles of money. Piles of He's cash, the man. Yeah. By the Jets Wakes the up in the morning. He's the king of Chicago. <laughs> it's not a Froman, it's Meathead. Not a Froman. That's right. So uh, again, I want to thank everybody for doing this. Hopefully everybody on the live stream uh, found some type of value in these live shows. Big learning experience for me. Two hours for the last 12 years to set a standard adding one extra hour for the last three days. It's been wow. a little bit. It hadn't been the vacation that you thought it was going to be. I didn't realize I was going to have to pee in the third hour. <laughs> I never had to in the second hour, but in the third hour, I got to pee. <laughs> Lessons learned for next year. Uh, Make sure until, to check. There's no buckets yeah, on That's the right. Day. Until Nothing. next Tuesday at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time when we do the traditional Barbecue Central show. I'll leave you with these two thoughts. National Barbecue and Grilling Association, consider joining for crying out loud. And September 11, 2001, I will never forget. Good night now.